The biggest. The heaviest. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's stuck on the track. The most. And the most expensive goods on Earth. Everything people can move. On land. On water. And in the air. Record-breaking, stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. It is the biggest container ship in the world, the OOCL Hong Kong. She has the potential to change the transport business forever, to drive many other transport ships out of the market and to conquer the seven seas. No other ship moves as many containers as she does, but only if her maiden voyage is a success. The OOCL Hong Kong must reach her destination safely and on schedule, a risky race against time. She has never been tested on the high seas before. This maiden voyage is a true mega transport and it will demand everything from the crew. This is a very challenging thing to, um, to bring out a new ship like this. The route goes through the Suez Canal and through pirate territory. I see, uh, no one can help you. A mega transport on the high seas. Now. Kochi in South Korea. It is the busiest shipyard on Earth, as big as a small city. Over 35,000 people work here. They are building six container ships of the new premium class, a value of 950 million US dollars. These new mega transporters are a massive challenge for engineers and shipbuilders. More than 21,000 containers must fit perfectly into the cargo area. Any mistake would not get noticed until loading and could have catastrophic consequences. Du Chin Choi surveys the cargo area. He only has this one chance. Once at sea, it will no longer be possible to make improvements. If the ships get bigger and bigger, it means for me there are a million things more to check and get right. Especially with the container ship. Precision in all measurements is the most important thing during the construction. Our work really seals the fate of the ship. Du Chin Choi uses a special 3D scanner. He will do everything possible to ensure no measurement errors are made. For him, it is a question of honor. All the same, his team checks every loading berth with a test container. For me personally, I'm incredibly proud to be working on this gigantic, record-breaking vessel, and I want to get it right. It is really one of a kind. We put all the newest innovations in this. Her five sister ships are still being built, but the OOCL Hong Kong is ready for her maiden voyage. She is about 400 meters long. In comparison, the Titanic was only 269 meters. The biggest container ship in the world even outshines the Empire State Building. It can load 21,413 containers and transport more than 191,000 deadweight tons. That corresponds approximately to the weight of 336 A380 airplanes, an inconceivable record. Twelve tiers of containers can be stacked below deck, and twelve more on the upper deck. One single man is responsible for the ship, its crew and its cargo. 
he must bring one of the biggest marine transporters of all time safely to its destination. If he passes this test, he will be considered one of the best captains in the world. Lam Chung Fat was brave enough to take the job. This is the biggest one I've been on. Uh, the last one that I was on in this company was only 13,000 TUs. And this is like a big jump. So actually, this is a very stressful job, although uh, you don't see me running around or anything, but actually there's a lot of things happening behind. The engine must be running properly, the cargo are uh, in good condition, you know, we're on schedule, stuff like that. So it is very stressful, but you know, you, you have to find time to relax yourself. And one of my favorite things is to come out here to just look around and just feel the breeze on your face and in your hair. One last deep breath, then the OOCL Hong Kong will set off on her maiden voyage. With him on board is his dear friend, Lim Keng Hock, the chief officer. His job is to make sure the crew functions well from the very beginning, and he must do so on a ship that no one knows. It's quite hectic because we just left the shipyard, and uh, so we have to bring them up to speed. So we have to keep on training and uh, there's a lot of work to do. The first task for the officer and his team, to raise the anchor. On small ships, this is no problem. But on the biggest container ship in the world, it is hard work. Hong Kong forward, how is the cable? Yeah, stand by. The anchor's weight and its cable make sure that the ship does not drift or tip over. There is one anchor on each side of the ship's bow. Okay, Roger. Roger. Forward, Chief Mate. Please bring the anchor home. Everything on this ship is oversized, bigger, heavier, and thus also more ponderous and slower than on other transport ships. Anchor and cable together measure over 770 meters in total and weigh more than 440 tons. Lin Keng Hock and his team must work safely above all, but also as fast as possible. That is the only way for the OOCL Hong Kong to capture the top position in the shipping business. Dead slow ahead. The mega transporter's maiden voyage lasts about 30 days. The first destination, Shanghai, the largest port on Earth. After that comes the first ordeal on the high seas, a voyage to Singapore. There, the OOCL Hong Kong will load its final cargo. Its route then takes it to the Suez Canal. The narrow passage is a risky maneuver and the toughest test for ship and crew. In Rotterdam, the largest port in Europe, the maiden voyage will come to an end. Yangshen, the deep water port of Shanghai and the mega transport's first stop. 13 million containers are loaded here every year. It is not only the biggest, but also the busiest port on Earth. 30 ships can dock and load at the same time. And precisely that will be a problem for the OOCL Hong Kong. Two hours from the port, Captain Lam Chung Fat is tense. No wonder. It is his first berthing maneuver with this gigantic ship. He has requested a local pilot. The pilot boat yeah. is approaching. Get okay. the senior B to rig the starboard side pilot ladder four meters above the water. The pilot must bring his small boat alongside the mega transporter and jump onto a rope ladder at the right moment. The pilot boat uh, may be moving up and down a lot, and this is quite risky for the pilot. So for the pilot, this is one of the most uh, 
uh, risky part of his job actually to get onto the ship. Indeed, there have been many fatal accidents during bad weather and rough seas. Islets have fallen from the ladder, drowned or been crushed between the ships. Thankfully, the sea is quiet today and the pilot comes aboard uneventfully. Hello. This is the first berth of this vessel, right? Yes. Everyone at the port is already pretty excited. As soon as the pilot is on board, he becomes a member of the crew and has the same rank as the captain. From now on, he gives the orders. With the aid of tugboats, he maneuvers the mega transporter into the port. Number two. Push slowly. The OOCL Hong Kong is a gigantic challenge for the pilot as well. Captain Lam Chong Fat must trust him blindly. Here I, I still can understand some Chinese, but in some other ports I absolutely do not understand. Number one, hurry up. The captain knows the seven seas. The pilot, only this one port, but he knows it inside out. Water depth, sandbanks, and other dangers. But he does not know the OOCL Hong Kong, and the berthing maneuver is difficult. For the berth is between two container ships. The parking space is narrow, very, very narrow. In theory, the maneuver is quite simple. Three tugboats push the mega transporter slowly and carefully towards the key wall. The greatest danger, if they push too forcefully, the OOCL Hong Kong cannot stop. She would hit the key wall and in the worst case could capsize. Captain Lam Chung Fat can only stand by and watch as the pilot walks the tightrope. Number one, stop. Number two, push slowly. Wind is strong. Number one, stop. Ten meters. Stop the bow. Stop bow. Speed is good. Don't go too fast. Keep going slowly. The wind is strong. It's coming slowly, slowly to the jetty outside. Watch carefully. Number two, stop. The berthing maneuver is complete. Normally reserved, Captain Lam Chong Fat sounds relieved. This is textbook. Slowly, slowly. Yeah. It's good. First, first, first. You must <laughs> slowly, slowly, not very fast. Safety first, huh? Yes. <laughs> the mega transporter loads more than 4,000 containers here in Shanghai, including highly sensitive cargo like deep frozen goods and hazardous materials. Cranes raise the covers from the cargo cells. Now the OOCL Hong Kong's true size is revealed. At the same time below deck, Chief Officer Lim Keng Hock must make sure the loading goes smoothly. For him, it is less a job than a dream come true. I've been at sea for 35 years. So ever since I was small, I live on an island. 
in Malaysia. So as a kid, I always see ships, cargo ships. So I always thought uh, one day I might work on one of these ships and finally I'm here. His first task, to check the manifest and all available information about every individual container. What is being loaded? Where is it being loaded? And what does that mean for the OOCL Hong Kong? If cargo weight is distributed unevenly, it could cause a catastrophe. The mega transporter steel frame could bend. With over 21,000 containers and 200,000 tons of cargo weight, Lim cannot commit one calculation error. We have to make sure that everything is loaded as, as per the plan. Different colors are the port of discharge. We are going to Gdansk, Felixstowe, Rotterdam and also Germany. The workflow is quite large, I would say, and it's challenging, so you need a lot of, you need to be very focused. Hong Kong third mate, chief mate calling. Yes, should just go ahead. Yes, the cargo plan is ready, you can come to the office. Over. Lin Kang Hock must not only make sure that the containers are put in the right place, but also that they are loaded in the correct order. If the crane operators make mistakes here, one side could become too heavy, and in the worst case, the ship could capsize. To keep this from happening, the OOCL Hong Kong has gigantic water tanks. When empty, she can take on up to 65,000 tons of seawater. At port, this ballast can be pumped between the individual tanks to maintain balance. As more cargo is loaded, the OOCL Hong Kong pumps the water back into the sea. If it's within limits, then we are fine. But the optimum uh, objective is to have minimum ballast so that we just carry cargo and have uh, optimum trim so that we can, we can move at a very good speed. Oh, shit. Yes, tell me. Everything fine? Yes, everything is fine. How many cranes working? Seven cranes working, Chief. Okay, this is the loading plan for this port. Uh, for the reefers, we have 14 reefers. Okay, loading 14 reefers. Yeah, this is according to the manifest to check ventilation. Okay. And uh, DGs, we have uh, quite a lot, 66. 60, 60 G. So ensure all labels are okay. Okay, label and the position according okay. to the day time. Yeah. So just check the moorings and everything is okay. 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 Any Thank problem, you. give me a call. Yes, sure. Okay. okay. Sneakers, laptops and televisions, but also DG, dangerous cargo like chemicals. All this and much more is now on its way to Europe. In only 30 days, the mega transport is scheduled to arrive there. The next leg of the voyage four days on the high seas. On their way to Singapore, crew and ship will encounter many dangers. The cargo must get to Europe as quickly as possible. The mega transport will only be profitable if the OOCL Hong Kong sticks to its schedule. But this ship is about more than profitability and money, more than engineering and technology. This ship arouses emotions, at least in Chief Officer Lim Keng Hock. When you look at the ship from a distance, uh, you will be quite amazed at how, how big the vessel is. But when you're on board, you get used to it. I uh, have this affinity to shipping and so, uh, even up to now, uh, I still find it's, even though it's challenging, but uh, I find it is a rewarding career. So at the end of the day, when you sign off, you're uh, you quite a happy man. In contrast to many other container ships, the OOCL Hong Kong can load an additional upper tier of containers. But it only works with exceptionally complex securing mechanisms. 
This piece over here is a semi-auto twist lock. So it's used to secure the deck containers together. Uh, we can uh, stack uh, 12 tiers on deck. So four pieces of this are fitted on the four ends of the container. And uh, it's heavy and we have uh, 24,000 on board. So you can imagine the number of containers we can load on deck. So this is loaded automatically and uh, when during discharge, we have to manually open them so they can, they can be discharged. And uh, this one over here are uh, turnbuckles. These struts secure the containers to the lashing bridges and to one another. Every day, the crew checks whether they are tight enough. A storm or high waves could cause them to waver or even rip them off the ship. The securing equipment and related technology costs over one million US dollars. So as you can see, the crew now, they are checking and making sure that everything is, is at the right position and all containers that have been loaded is uh, lashed down properly. One part of the cargo requires special attention. Reefer engineer, reefer engineer, chief officer calling. Yes, Jimmy. Now we go to check reefer. Okay, Roger. Twice a day, electricians check the reefers. They always go in pairs, as no job may be done alone. The danger is too great that a crew member might fall or go overboard. In the worst case, it would take hours before such an accident were noticed. These reefers transport valuable food. They function like a refrigerator. They are fully insulated and have their own cooling unit, which is connected to the ship's power supply. The electricians must check every individual container and its temperature. Reefer engineer, come in. Reefer engineer, chief officer calling. Yes, Jimmy. Yes, how's the condition of all the loaded reefers? Uh, now all reefer is okay. Fully loaded, the mega transporter consumes nearly nine tons of heavy fuel oil per hour. Fuel is thus by far the largest cost factor of this kind of intercontinental transport. Ultimately, such a transport must be profitable for the shipping company. Thus, the captain uses every possible trick to travel as economically as possible. Weather, wind and more. The idea is efficiency. Maybe not necessarily the shortest route, but actually we also take advantage of current to help us uh, get better speed. And uh, yeah, the, of course, the whole target is to uh, conserve fuel and of course, then cost. At the same time, in the engine room. The engine block is nine stories high and has over 100,000 horsepower. This is one of the biggest and most powerful diesel engines in the world. Li Wai Chi is chief engineer on board and must keep this tremendous power generator under control. But he too is getting to know the OOCL Hong Kong for the first time. To understand how the ship reacts, he and his team collect all the data, recording every revolution and temperature. Anything that could be of use in an emergency. Ming Yanqi is a new type and it's a good engine. So far, so good. But of course, we still have some minor problems. That's why surface engineers, they try to collect data and then try to improve. He shares his data with the engine builder, who is always improving his products. The goal, to reduce fuel consumption and emissions. Like the ship is big or small, I, I still try my best to work. I'm happy because I'm also a green man. <laughs> the night before the OOCL Hong Kong reaches Singapore, a critical night. A pirate area stands between the crew and safe harbour.
we take precautions uh, as for the uh, industry standard, so it is risky. The crew goes through the emergency plan for such situations. Usually, there are no weapons on board. The men could only shoot at attackers with water cannons or lock themselves in. Remember, if anything wrong, just press the alarm and then come. And then also, don't leave any door. Oh, I just go. Maybe five minutes, I come back. No, not alarm. You must lock. Everyone senses what no one says out loud. The biggest container ship in the world on its maiden voyage is an attractive target for pirates. The ransom for the captain is enticing. With a ship this size, it is actually unimaginable. But pirates could indeed come on board with grappling hooks and take the crew hostage. Five hours in the danger zone. Nothing to see, only pitch black night. We need to keep the uh, light condition as low as possible in order for us to get uh, the best visibility outside. So um, bright lights is out, so usually um, we get uh, red lights, which is actually good for the eyes uh, in terms of uh, night vision at night. Suddenly, the second mate sees something on the horizon. A boat with no identifying marks. Not one, but rather a whole fleet. And it is on course for the OOCL Hong Kong. The port side may be a border. Captain Lam Chung Fat sends a warning signal. Captain, send the right. Ready now. Yeah, you can flash at him. Okay, flash. I'll give warning. Okay. Hopefully, it is fishermen and not pirates. If so, they would react to the signal and get out of the mega transporter's way. Because he's flashing the light. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Indeed. Only a couple of fishing boats that had strayed off course. Two three zero. Two three zero. Unfortunately, at sea we have rules of the roads, but smaller boats and uh, they they don't really follow these rules and and uh, so uh, when we see something that uh, it's quite close to us, uh, we cannot wait until they take action. The danger zone has been crossed. And the OOCL Hong Kong has reached the port of Singapore unscathed. It's the last port before the two week non stop journey to Europe. Time for the mega transporter to refuel. Heavy oil for about 1 million euros. And more containers are loaded on board. Go forward, 10 meters ahead. The special challenge. Some containers from China have reached their destination here in Singapore. Others are only beginning their journey to Europe. That means loading and unloading at the same time. Mega transporters like the OOCL Hong Kong need ports that can keep pace with them. Ports that can load more and more containers faster and faster. That's why Singapore has invested in a smart port. From this command center, the containers can be moved by joystick. Many cranes are remote controlled. Operators choose the crane they need at the moment. That means no people, no pathways, no danger of injury. Camera and sensor technology makes loading precise, 
and quick. The OOCL Hong Kong is now fully loaded and on its way to Europe. Someone has sounded the alarm. It was the chief officer. Lim Keng Hock wants to know how his new team works under pressure. Emergency squad or command squad? Emergency squad, this is command squad, go ahead. Uh, we know the nature of emergency, over. Roger, there is fire at day 30 and row 08. Near the high tiers, over. Roger, fire at day 30. Okay. Portable monitor, go. The two guys help them. Within seconds, the team must be ready for action. For in an emergency, a fire could reach hazmat containers holding acid, gases and fuel. This drill has only one goal. The crew must be able to get around the new ship blindfolded. Above all, in an extreme situation. They must know the shortest pathways and overcome their fear of heights in an emergency. To extinguish a fire, the team must climb to a height of nearly 20 meters, unsecured at full speed and in heavy wind. What we fear most is a fire on, on one of the containers on deck, as it can spread very fast. So as you can see, we can carry up to 12 tiers on deck. The biggest challenge, pulling the heavy water hoses up to the vertiginous heights. Behind the tumbaker! Who behind the tumbaker? Up top, the team mounts the water cannons. Hydrant Bay 31, stand by! The OOCL Hong Kong can pump seawater up to a height of 36 meters. The crew doesn't know what exactly is in the containers. A real problem. I heard of fires which lasted for three days. So it's quite, uh, quite tiring to fight this kind of fires. So you need a proper equipment and you need a good team of people. Below the containers, Chief Engineer Li Wai Chi prepares for the emergency. For seamen, most threatened is fire. Once fire, no one can help. If the cargo below deck catches fire, the team cannot extinguish it with water. Li Wai Chi would have to evacuate all the rooms and flood them with the contents of about 800 CO2 canisters, thus smothering the fire. By doing so, he would also paralyze the entire ship. That's the last resort. Once we put this in, then maybe 24 hours, the ship is not, cannot move because no oxygen, combustion engine, no oxygen cannot move. So before we release this, captain usually put the ship in a relative safe place and then we release. Because for 24 hours, maybe we don't have any power. Back on deck. Hydrant 31, open! Monitor day 29, shoot to the center! Shoot to the center! Monitor day 29, are you ready? Host ready. Uh, all station, all station. 
Uh, the drill is over. Fire extinguish. All stations stand down. Stand down. Over. After this successful drill, the mega transporter resumes its course. Two routes lead to Europe the long way around Africa, and the short passage through the Suez Canal. This route saves a lot of time and fuel, but the journey through the extremely narrow canal is risky, especially for the biggest container ship in the world. For about 150 years, the Suez Canal has been amongst the most important waterways on Earth, but cargo ships continue to get longer and wider and have a deeper draft. That means the canal must get bigger too. Above all, its depth is crucial. A new additional canal section has been opened since 2015. Nevertheless, the passage is still one of the most difficult maneuvers in seafaring. But whoever wants to remain competitive in the shipping business must confront the canal. That includes BOOCL Hong Kong. No ocean giant is allowed here without an escort. The Suez Canal Authority pilots every single cargo ship through the narrow passage. An extreme responsibility rests on the shoulders of the pilots and their commander. Captain Mohammed Fawzi Abdel Kader. through the eye of the needle for 193 kilometers. Captain Fawzi monitors the ship's passage through 15 checkpoints. How many vessels are expected today? 45 vessels, 20 entering from the south in Suez and 25 vessels from Port Said with a total tonnage of 2,527,000 tons. Shipping companies pay high fees for their ship's passage, varying according to their weight. The OOCL Hong Kong's passage costs around 1 million US dollars. The Suez Canal is the backbone of the Egyptian economy. And we are trying everything we can to attract the largest number of vessels to pass through the channel. An accident would be a catastrophe, not only for the OOCL Hong Kong's maiden voyage, but also for the canal and thus for Egypt's economy. The passage simply has to be successful. The process of navigating through the Suez Canal is a really sensitive and difficult process. It's really hard and requires a lot of experience to guide the ships through, especially container ships. A big challenge for the pilots is climatic factors such as sandstorms. They hinder the vision of the pilots so they can no longer see the sides of the canal. A look below the water's surface shows that the canal is deep enough for megatransporters like the OOCL Hong Kong, but only in the middle. The pilot has only a few meters of wiggle room to the left and to the right. The moment has come. The greatest ordeal of the megatransporter's maiden voyage is imminent, and Captain Lam Chung Fat can do nothing. His hands are tied. When we are inside the canal, this is actually one of the concerns uh, because the, the canal is narrow and shallow and uh, there's very, very little margin for error. They have uh, hopefully very good pilots there. In point of fact, the Suez Canal's 300 pilots are among the best in the world. Before being allowed to operate a mega freighter, a pilot must have trained for 15 years. Pilots train their wits and agility using a simulator, which portrays ships of every size and all conceivable weather conditions and scenarios.
course now. For zero three three. Zero four zero. Zero four zero. Starboard twenty. Starboard twenty. I need to think about 100,000 things at the same time. Wind, current, engine, rudder, everything. I need to feel the whole atmosphere and become one with the ship. In a real situation, there is no second try. While the others train, Chief Pilot Farouk Fouda makes his way to the OOCL Hong Kong to guide it through the canal. He grew up in Germany. The captain needs perhaps four or five months on a ship to know how it reacts, how it moves. I have to know in one minute, right away. If I don't go to starboard, what happens? Port, how much rudder do I need? How much power? He has seen how the canal and the ships that pass through it have grown. Farouk Fouda suppresses all nervousness. His more than 40 years of professional experience help him keep cool in view of the mega freighter and the task before him. There is no tension, no. You can't be tense. Otherwise, you have no control over the ship. You always have to have strong nerves. He'll need them now on the OOCL Hong Kong. OOCL stands for Orient Overseas Container Line. Founded in Hong Kong in 1947, today, this shipping company is one of the biggest in the world. The ship's name is thus no coincidence. The company intends to write history with it. Farouk Fouda comes on board just in time. He literally has everything in hand. Will he manage to write a new chapter in the history of the trade route between East Asia and Europe? From this point forward, he is in command. The passage lasts about 11 hours. On average, 49 ships traverse the canal every day, grouped into convoys. The pilots have to coordinate speed and the distance between ships perfectly. Otherwise, there could be fatal collisions. The OOCL Hong Kong is the biggest ship that has ever tried to pass through the canal. The outcome of one of the biggest sea transports of all time will be decided here, in the Suez Canal. Captain Lam Chung Fat can only stand by and watch. This ship is uh, much bigger than the other ship, so usually in my heart I silently pray. Everyone in the control room is holding their breath, too. Finally, the biggest container ship in the world leaves the narrow canal. The Mediterranean is in sight. Chief pilot Farouk Fouda has once again demonstrated that experience is golden. At over 70 years old, he has set a new record and brought the biggest container ship in the world through the canal. I've done a good job if the ship arrives safely and uneventfully. It feels good, makes me happy. The OOCL Hong Kong sets course for Rotterdam. It passes through the Mediterranean and the Straits of Gibraltar. 21,000 kilometers halfway around the world. 
she reaches her destination almost perfectly on schedule. Hundreds of spectators show up to watch the majestic finale of her successful maiden voyage. They want to witness a true mega transport. It is perhaps one of those proverbial moments one can tell one's grandchildren about. How can it even move with so many containers on deck? How does it stay afloat? And when I heard that it will come to the port of Rotterdam, I just had to come to see it with my own eyes. This maiden voyage demanded everything of the crew. Proud but visibly exhausted, Chief Officer Lin Keng Hock gives the signal to berth. About 200,000 tons of consumer goods from Asia have reached their destination in Europe. Captain Lam Chung Fat has been at sea since 1983. This maiden voyage was the greatest challenge of his career. He has met the challenge. Well, I think uh, we did a good job, you know. I mean, uh, this is a big ship. We carry many, many containers. We have to also um, thank the uh, team that we have on the ship as well, yeah. I couldn't think of anything else I'll be doing, I mean, uh, for the past 30, 40 years, yeah. It's, it's a good job, yeah. I'm pretty proud about it, yeah. Captain Lam Chung Fat will command the OOCL Hong Kong for another six months, along with his friend, the chief officer. The OOCL Hong Kong sister ships will also be in regular service between Europe and East Asia. The most important trade route in the world, in the past, present and future. The biggest, the heaviest, Fuck. Oh, it's stuck on the, track. the most, and the most expensive goods on earth. Everything people can move. On land, on water, and in the air. Record-breaking, stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. Today on Mega Transports, a ship that ships ships. Andrei Chaikin is the captain. He avoids heavy seas, for his cargo, worth millions, must arrive safely at any price. We try to avoid waves higher than four meters. The Yacht Express is a so-called semi-submersible ship. It can flood its cargo deck. Its cargo, luxury yachts. Henry Evans is like their babysitter. Right now it's 16 yachts floating at once. Hey diver, talk to me. Special divers, a special ship on this mega transport. Just about everything is special. Probably just two of these in the world that uh, transport yachts and it's such a spectacular uh, way. A shuttle service for luxury yachts. 
across the Atlantic with a yacht express. Now, April, luxury yachts gather around Miami, like migratory birds, to relocate to their summer quarters, the Mediterranean coast of Southern Europe. They are waiting for the world's first and biggest speciality ship for transporting luxury yachts to arrive, the Yacht Express. It may sound simple, but for Captain Andre, it feels like juggling raw eggs. Yachts are very fragile creature, and uh, crossing the Atlantic is uh, a challenge even for uh, big commercial ships. 209 meters long, 32 and a half meters wide. Being transported with us, they are in safe hands. A true mega transporter. Fort Lauderdale cargo port, 30 kilometers north of Miami. As soon as the Yacht Express is moored, the clock starts ticking for loading master Henry Evans. He has 48 hours and not one more. Our clientele is very scheduled with their yachts and they need their yachts at a certain time and our job is to make sure they're happy and get the ship right on time and be underway. No time to go on land. Loading master Henry, Captain Andre and the crew begin immediately with the submersion. The stern gate is lowered. The dry area where Henry is now standing will soon be flooded with ocean water several meters deep. In about three hours, this will be right at water level tonight. This, the deck will be 10, 5 centimeters above the deck level. Six in the morning is when we'll do the final submerge, and then we'll submerge another four and a half meters. If you see these draft marks. The Yacht Express can sink 5.8 meters down to a maximum depth of 14 meters. Captain Henry, Captain Henry. Henry, go ahead. Yeah, Cap, just looking at the deck, if tomorrow 13 one's no problem. No, it doesn't matter, 13 or 13.2, same thing. The submersion begins. Up on the bridge, Captain Andre controls four pumps below in the hull. They fill the ballast tanks until the ocean washes over the deck's edge. This will be a critical part because during the uh, uh, final submersion, when uh, the water starts flooding the cargo deck, uh, ship stability will be reduced drastically. And uh, during uh, those one and a half hours, I will be watching the list very uh, carefully until we are on a final uh, Draft. And that's how the cargo is loaded. The pumps fill the ballast tanks with seawater. The Yacht Express sinks. Once the cargo deck is flooded, the luxury yachts pull in. So far, everything is easy. But then, the Yacht Express will rise again. Its cargo deck, including the parked yachts, will be out of the water and dry. Every individual yacht must land precisely on the wooden blocks. The problem, wood is easy on the hull, but it drifts away underwater. So just making sure everything's welded because tomorrow when we sink, you'll have a big problem if one of these blocks float. Boom, 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 boom. This time, Henry has to take care of 16 luxury yachts. By tomorrow evening at the latest, they must be out of the water again. Early the next morning, even before sunrise, it's already rush hour at Fort Lauderdale's cargo port. As planned, the mega transporter has sunk to sea level. This is the critical moment. Captain Andre does not want to be disturbed. Water from the harbor floods inside the Yacht Express through openings on the side. At first, 
the water gathers in the middle of the cargo deck floor, the deepest point. Soon, it also streams through the stern gate. In two hours, the cargo deck is flooded. At sunrise, Henry and the ship's crew review the loading plan. But first, the yachts that were brought here by the mega transporter have to leave the deck. All these big Modi yachts are professional captains, so they know exactly what they're doing. They can drive in, drive out. Um, again, it's timing. Like right now we are an hour behind schedule, which is normal because you want to take your time bringing in this cargo inside. Loading begins with a so-called sail-in. 16 yachts drive onto the cargo deck. Smaller yachts could be loaded onto normal cargo ships with cranes. But luxury yachts can only travel without risk of scratching on ships like the Yacht Express. But security has its price. Depending on the size, it's about $250,000 per voyage. At 10 a.m., the first luxury yacht moors. Each of the 16 ending positions is precisely laid out, strictly according to Henry's plan. The second luxury yacht comes. Its length puts it in the category of mega yachts, the Skyfall. Furnished by Patrick Knowles, the Versace of yacht cabin designers. The $30 million yacht is more than 57 meters long and was built in 2010. There is space for 12 guests, jacuzzi on deck, six luxury cabins. One week's rent costs about $300,000. Yeah, well, Skyfall is a private charter. So we have a private owner and Skyfall named after the James Bond movies. We do a lot of Bahamas. We're going to Greece, and we'll stay around Italy and France. Alexander's price is the so-called rider of the Skyfall. Once the yacht is moored, the rest of the crew leaves the ship. Only Alexander's and one engineer are allowed to cross the Atlantic with the Skyfall, a real privilege. Probably just two of these in the world that uh, transport yachts in a such a spectacular uh, way. So it is good to be here. Spectacular, special, expensive. The mega transporter alone costs $60 million. The value of the yachts is three times as much. An insured value of $188 million is swimming in Henry's cargo deck. Change of scene. A couple of hundred meters landward, a group of professional divers is getting ready with their boss, Jeffrey Ballantyne. Their job today is to place the 16 yachts securely on the wooden blocks while the cargo deck goes dry. A dangerous job and special too. Today, for the first time, Jeffrey is a mere observer. 30 years as a diver, it's almost longer than anybody ever makes it because uh, the uh, hostility of the environment, the constant pressures have gotten me to the point where uh, I, uh, not retire, but I will step back and not go so much in the water anymore. With a smile, I say it, it says, I do hurt every day when I get up. Today, for the first time, it's his son, Bowie, who's the boss in the water. I want him to be retired and happy with his wife at home and not have to worry about anything at all. You know, I just want, he just turned 52, so for me, the earlier I can get him retired, the better. I want all the stress off of him so he can enjoy himself. You know, because I'm young and, like, I mean, in the past two days, I think I worked almost 40 hours. <laughs> so, yeah, after this, I'm gonna go do some hot yoga. <laughs> in Fort Lauderdale Harbor, the sail in is still in full swing. Everybody ready for today? Hey, everything ready? Once in the harbor, 
Father Jeffrey turns things over to son Bowie. He will lead the 10 divers. As soon as the last yacht is moored in the cargo deck, they'll get started. Guys, 30 minutes though, maybe 15. Henry wants to make up some time. And guys, now make fast on the springs, make fast on the springs. Good, that's good, that's good. Right now, the last yacht is driving onto the mega transporter's deck. The boats are packed close together, but they must never touch one another. The transport company DYT would lose its reputation. It would be like a car company delivering luxury vehicles with dents. And nicely done, Captain. Everything's inside, safe and sound. Always the last one in, always normal, but yep, everything driven in safe. Divers splash, do a little briefing, and then the party really starts. Like in a game of Tetris, six hours after the deck flooding, the 16 yachts are parked. But the yachts can't cross the ocean safely like this. That's why the water has to be drained from the deck first and within 24 hours. Otherwise, the time plan is at risk. Henry gives the divers instructions. Without them, the yachts would tip over when the water sinks below their keels. The divers must stabilize them with heavy metal supports, and that requires detailed planning. But it really should be, I mean, touching the same time touching at the same time. It should be like literally we can do eight boats in an hour if we get everything squared away. Once again, when the water drains, the divers must make sure not only that the yacht's keels sink gently and precisely onto the wooden blocks, they must also brace the yachts with metal supports to keep them from tipping over when the water recedes. The difficulty, all the supports must be positioned with absolute precision and the divers must not get caught in the middle. Bowie must take care of something else, too. As team leader, he is the one responsible for safety. Oh, I think it's working out very well. Just standing back a little bit because it's not my show anymore. It's my son's now, but I still look over the side and make sure that the tanks are away from the gangway, that people let people get off before they have to go on, and all the simplistic stuff that I'm, you know, used to doing. So I got to make sure that everything is OK. I just have a hard time really ripping myself away because I've done this for so long, so I, I hate giving it up. The Yacht Express begins to rise. Bowie and the four other divers make their way to its stern. From the shore, Bowie has already discerned yet another difficulty. The visibility is pretty horrible out there, but I've done zero visibility dives all over the world, so it's not a big deal. Barely in the water, Bowie already has a problem. One of his flippers came off when he jumped in, and he can't find it. Good thing Dad's there. It's two masks, three fins in our company, okay? So we'll, we'll get it, no worries. Clearly, it's too soon for Dad to retire. Hey, Bo. What size is that? It's a size that'll fit you. Right? Usually, you only lose a fin when you really need it. You never use a fin if everything is calm. So when the current runs by the ship and, the fi and you jump in here and it breaks and you go down, obviously right now you can't see anything in this water. You have no chance of finding the fin again. The current makes it difficult for the divers to brace the keels. Things get even shakier when a ship goes by and the swell hits. And around the Miami metropolitan area, there are very many and very big ships underway. At least the half-raised stern gate offers some protection. For Bowie and his crew of divers, the trick is not to get caught between the keels, the wooden blocks, or the iron supports. Later, when the yacht's keels sink down, 
Bowie and his divers send up updates. The divers are like an underwater eye. Yeah, right now I'm swimming alongside the keel, checking for any protrusions, making sure that there's nothing that will uh, cause damage if it uh, touches directly on the cribbing wood, as these vessels are worth a lot of money. And indeed, Bowie finds something. Now he must make sure that when the keel sinks down, this bulge comes to lie right between the two wooden blocks. If necessary, they'll have to move the yacht forward. They keep an eye on everything sticking out of the keel. They continually report to Henry up top. For everyone, it's communication that matters now and timing. Before I go up, I want to make sure all yellows are clear of stabilizers. The diver's job is to set up the lateral iron supports, but without letting them touch the sides of the keel. Not yet, at least. They are very heavy and they could definitely cut off your foot or leg or injure you very badly. So we have to be careful and communicate properly. There you have to be careful because if your fingers get caught in between there, it'll slice it, slice it off instantaneously. Each yacht's keel requires its own timing. Sometimes the divers don't get it right. Oma! Can I go up now? Now and again, Henry, the loading master, interrupts the sinking of the yachts. Then he has to alert Captain Andre on the bridge to stop the pumps. If the supports drift away, Bowie and his team have to bring them back to their position immediately. The supports are still not allowed to touch the keels. Under this weight, even iron could break. Once we get them in position, then It'll start, this one's done, and this one's done, and this one's done, this one's done. But right now it's 16 yachts floating at once, trying to fall in the cribbing. Normal, but we'll get it done. It's going too slow for Henry. It's already clear it will take much more time for the yachts to sink than planned. Henry gives the team new assignments. Second! I want you to stay with the divers so you can talk to them so I can check up, okay? Right now, all three of these yachts are roughly 50 centimeters clearance, all in good position. So, all in good position, right? Stabilizers are clear, everything's good. Tell boat, hey! A speeding boat approaches. Thank you. It's actually, legally, there's a diver's flag hanging up. No one really looks, but... The door is here because of the door, but on the side casings, there's a lot of open holes, and that's where it'll leak in. And again, divers are working underneath. If they can minimum swell, safer for them. Henry goes to the middle of the cargo deck. Despite the waves, the divers have to do their jobs. I think there's someone there. Hey, diver, talk to me. All good? Stabilizers are clear. Thank you. So far, the water level in the cargo deck has decreased by just about one meter. Everyone hopes the pumps don't fail now. We always have a plan B. It could happen, uh, unlikely, but we may have a stuck uh, ballast valve, so pumps not functioning for that. We need to, we will have to stop for a while and uh, see how we can rectify it. But uh, that does happen uh, regularly. So. At any rate, now would be the worst time. No, right now that measuring now it's compression with the keel. Um, the issue is you don't want to put the stands in too early because you'll put a dent in the hole. So you have to make sure the keel begins to bite nice and hard. The divers report. All of the yacht's keels are touching the wooden blocks. That's good. 
Only when the soft wood is carrying half the weight of all the yachts can their weight also be spread out over the iron supports. And at this precise moment, the captain interrupts. In uh, half an hour, the container ship will depart. So uh, we're facing uh, changes of the water. We'll have to uh, half a meter to 70 centimeters. All right, we'll get this done quick, and then I can probably go up and make sure I have all the big boys done. And then we'll probably stand by for the tenders, if that's OK. But you have them down now, and uh, when the uh, container ship passes, they will, they will be shifted again, uh, most probably. That's why I'm hoping I'm going to tell you to go up 25, 30 centimeters just to make them compressed. What's up? Hey, is there anyone over here? Um, hey, so there's a big container ship that's going to pass that will throw a big swell. It will destroy all of our work, so we need to go up, OK? The Yacht Express is still too low in the water. The water level in the cargo deck, too high. The yacht should have been fully loaded by 8 p.m. Now the delay could really cost them. The key is now beating this container ship. There's a big, massive container ship will suck out all the water. Yes, um, Captain, I believe you have one of your larger container vessels departing in, is it 30 minutes or an hour, Captain? In 30 minutes, we have a large container vessel departing town. Yes. Cap, may you advise the pilot, I mean, sir, may you advise the pilot just to go as slow as possible, just due to um, our critical cargo, we're at a pretty tough situation. So if he can go as slow as possible, highly appreciated. Um, this one's finished. This one's being double checked. This one's going to be. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Captain. Issue is, is. This container ship is so massive. When it passes, it takes out all the water underneath our ship. And then the ship will then sink naturally, which then means all these will float. So time is now serious essence. The race begins. In only 30 minutes, the team must get enough water out of the cargo deck so that not even the passing container ship will cause the water level to rise too high. In the worst case, the valuable yachts in the cargo deck would jostle around chaotically. Captain Andre keeps his eye steadily on the water level. Now we'll see if it's enough. The container ship has cast off. Its swell would also increase the danger to the divers. Divers to be safe in this container ship passing, please. What's up? Nervous? Yeah, a little bit. The divers try to finish their work in the seconds that remain. But you see it's vacuuming it in, and as he's vacuuming it in, our ship is sinking. And we don't want that, because we want to keep going up. Everything now depends on the container ship's pilot. Will he make allowances for the Yacht Express, or will it be business as usual? Slow, slow, slow. Easy, easy, easy. We did good. When he was coming in, in a hurry, the whole ship went a meter underwater, which is fine when there's no $188 million worth of cargo inside, but now there's $188 million worth of cargo inside. Uh, drop forward to 
It went up 25 centimeters. Third? Yeah, 11.25 forward. It was before 11.30. Everything went fine. I'm just so happy about that container ship. Captain Henry, Captain Henry, please go up as slow as possible for these tenders. Finally, the Yacht Express can rise further. The water drains. The 16 yachts stand securely on the wooden blocks. The job is done around midnight, a few hours later than planned. The divers are soaked, exhausted, dead tired. And Bowie, how did he feel about his first job as boss in the water? I'm feeling good. Long but a successful day for the most part. I think uh, everything will be good. We'll do a walk through shortly and make sure that everything worked out. Bowie was in the water for more than 10 hours non-stop. I feel like thank you for it to be over with finally. <laughs> but another day in the office. I really love what I do. And, uh... Henry, the loading master, and his team are also exhausted. Now they feel the strain of the completed job. Legs. We need some rice power. I can't stop. I'm over this. this is... Job well done. Everyone performed outstanding. But we still got about 24 hours of work to go. The next morning. The deck is dry. After a short sleep, the men are back to welding. They mount additional aluminium supports to give the yachts extra stability during the Atlantic crossing. Only now that the water has drained is the work the divers accomplished yesterday visible. After six hours of sleep, Bowie inspects the work. The reason why it took so long yesterday is because we had to have six of them touch at the same time. And all of them had different types of, see, this right here is a transducer. This isn't an issue, but when you have a very large one, such as something like this over here, protruding from the hull, you see, this was accounted for already in the plans. We did a very good job. Henry and, and DYT, they knew about this. They've done this before. So you can see, you could never go on something like this protruding because it'll cause damage to the yacht. And we don't, we don't want any damage. That's the main goal. It's safety first and then the yacht. The timing was crucial, and not only under the keel. The divers also had to find just the right position for the lateral supports under difficult conditions. It is a matter of centimeters whether the keel gets dented or not. See how this is halfway compressed? You do not want it to be totally squished and you do not want it to be open. So right now this is handling weight, but it's not over compressed. If it's smushed, smushed, then you know you the divers put the stands in too early. So that's why what took us yesterday was we wedged everything. So when they put this in, we would have no serious compression on all the yellows. And that's why all the cargo's perfect. Perfectly secured and stabilized, the costly yachts are now ready for the crossing. They won't make their 3 p.m. departure time. On the other hand, the transporters have no damages to report to the owners.
Even Jeffrey Ballantyne is satisfied with his son. Little Bowie is now a man. I saw that you can do it. And it's very hard for me to stay away because I want to tell you how to do it. And, and the only time we don't argue is when you do it and you do it your way. And your best effort has always been best and, and perfect for me. Bowie Ballantyne's trial by fire is behind him. But for the crew of the Yacht Express, the real job is only beginning. The Port Authority has given the Yacht Express a departure time of shortly before midnight. With 16 yachts on its cargo deck, the mega transporter disappears into the night. Leaving Fort Lauderdale, the Yacht Express begins its long journey from the southern tip of Florida across the Atlantic. Once in Europe, the ship passes through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Mediterranean. The destination, the port of Genoa in northern Italy. A distance of more than 4,600 nautical miles with many dangers for the valuable cargo. Mega transporter is on the high seas for about two weeks. Miami, Genoa, Miami is one of the main routes for the ship's owner, the Dutch transport company DYT. In 2007, the Yacht Express was the first transport ship of its kind and cost $16 million. At 209 meters long and 32 meters wide, and with a high speed of 18 knots, it is still an exceptional mega transporter. It allows yacht owners to offer their luxury boats in the Mediterranean in the summer and in the warmer Caribbean in the winter. A multi-million dollar business. Fort Lauderdale and Genoa. Captain Andre knows both ports well, especially their pitfalls and that helped this time on departure. We often moored in the middle of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, fairway. Uh, yeah, we have to struggle sometimes with the passing uh, traffic. And uh, when a vessel is submerged on a deep draft, we do feel interaction from uh, the container ships passing by. But in Genoa, there's another thing. There are very strong uh, winds, especially in autumn coming from the mountains that can affect uh, cargo operations as well. In order to keep the yachts from jostling unnecessarily in the ocean waves, Captain Andre travels at an average speed of only 15 knots. Most luxury yacht owners take advantage of the Yacht Express's transport service. Two crew members generally stay on the yachts to maintain and repair it. On the biggest yacht on board, the Skyfall, Alexander's job is to give the exquisite sun decks an occasional good scrubbing. And his captain has given him a special task via satellite telephone. He should remove lime deposits from the propellers and polish them. This is not a cosmetic, but rather a necessary maintenance. The task takes the young Australian half a day, and he has an ideal opportunity to carry it out. We don't get taken out of the water too much, so this is our one and only opportunity. And it's a good opportunity to get crew away for a holiday. So, two weeks holiday for the other crew members. Alexander's has nearly finished his job for today, but there is still one thing left to do. Prop Speed's a marine coating um, to help prevent growth on the propellers. Growth on the propellers means more friction. It helps 
eliminates more drag on the boat, so you go, you go quicker. To do his work, Alexanders gets water and electricity from the mega transporter. Time to look around. It took one and a half years to build at a Chinese shipyard. The so-called floating deck system was groundbreaking for its time. Before that, yachts could only be loaded onto ships by means of cranes. The new procedure was especially gentle on the keel. The 20-man crew is made up mostly of Filipinos, Russians and Ukrainians. All the crew members of the yachts are allowed to share in the three daily meals served in the ship's canteen. The Yacht Express has a fitness room, spacious cabins, conference rooms and a movie theater. In addition to a panorama bar, there is even a swimming pool. Small but nice, it is only filled on hot days, however. It is also worth taking a look inside the mega transporter's hull. Much is reminiscent of a submarine, and this is, of course, a semi-submersible. But only semi, the Yacht Express cannot submerge fully. Chief Engineer Andrei Tochilov on his inspection rounds. A corridor about 160 meters in length connects the superstructure with the engine at the stern. In between are the ballast tanks. Yeah, here. It's the main uh, ballast tanks are displaced. Now we are actually in the area of uh, ballast tank number four and number five. Tank top, uh, ballast tanks is uh, beside the bulkheads and uh, everywhere. While the chief engineer goes to the heart of the ship, the engine, officers on the bridge watch the weather and the waves. They must pay much closer attention than most officers on other large ocean vessels. Captain Andrei Chaikin once had to dodge a storm on the high seas. The waves would have given the cargo too much of a jolt. If the waves exceed a critical height, the yachts can even tip over. We try to avoid waves higher than four meters. Usually that's close to uh and what we're allowed to go through. So with the cargo we have on board, you really have to monitor the weather. They will reach the port of Genoa in two days. Then the Yacht Express will once again flood its ballast tanks. Make it watertight so the spaces are separated. We will not uh, sunk. Each time before the cargo deck is flooded, Chief Engineer Andrei Tochilov checks all the doors. In a labyrinth of corridors and engine rooms, all must be closed during flooding. Especially the large gate to the cargo deck. If water were to break through here, it would rush into the superstructure. Thankfully, the large gate is hermetically sealed, so the water can't get in. The heart of the mega transporter, the engine room. Two 8,700 kilowatt diesel alternators create power for the propeller's electric drive. To fill the ballast tanks, the Yacht Express has four pumps. Each one can pump up to 1.2 million liters per hour. That means one large room sized aquarium per second. Should water unexpectedly enter the ship and block the way, emergency corridors connect the lower deck to the top. The Yacht Express is designed for business growth. With a maximum speed of 18 knots, it is the fastest ship of its kind. Short transport times are important, especially for charter companies 
whose luxury yachts need to be booked all over the world each week. In addition to its ability to gulp down 35,000 tons of seawater, the Yacht Express has another special feature. At the bow and the stern, two so-called spud poles hang from wire cables. After mooring, the mega transporter can use these poles to bore into the seabed of the harbour. This keeps it stable while the yachts are driving in and out. The journey across the Atlantic is almost over. One more night, then Andrei Chaikin will guide his ship into the port of Genoa. There, the yacht's crews will come on board again. The summer season in the Mediterranean is beginning. The coast is in sight. Captain Andre was able to make up time and will deliver his cargo on schedule. If the weather over northern Italy doesn't upset his plans. Clouds gather quickly, a sign of possible wind. One hour to go. Wind speed in the Bay of Genoa is still within an acceptable range. So if the wind is strong, we may decide on using uh, additional ducts to assist us, but uh, as it looks today, the wind is favorable, so we will uh, maneuver ourselves. Uh, if the speed will exceed 30 knots or so, we may decide on postponing. Wind would create waves. A secure sailout would no longer be possible. Genoa is Italy's largest port. For a brief moment, the clouds open up. Suddenly, there is almost no wind at all. Captain Andre takes advantage of the opportune moment. 14 days after departing Fort Lauderdale, the Yacht Express docks on schedule. Tell me when you have a breast lines uh, on. The ship's crew tightens the mooring lines. The mega transporter has now been secured. It's good. So uh, today we were extremely lucky with the weather. You see, it nice and shiny, and uh, absolutely no wind. So coming alongside was uh, really. Uh, Nice and easy job. And uh, here we are. Atlantic is crossed. A bunch of mega yachts are ready to float in the Mediterranean for the new season. We made it nice and safe. Everything is so far so good. Captain Andre immediately begins the submersion. Alexander's cleans the Skyfall's deck again and the deckhands remove all the additional aluminium supports and transport securing devices. In two days, the Skyfall will pick up its first charter guests near Monaco. The next day, the cargo deck is sunk and flooded. The mega transporter submerges. The engines of the 16 luxury yachts start. Everything is ready for the sail out. But it's cool just to see a whole different um, area of docking the ship. For me, it's small lines, but for these guys, they've got lines on drums and 
everything's just on a bigger scale. The Yacht Express, a unique transport ship for yachts. Its ability to cross the open sea makes the difference. Thanks to this mega transporter, luxury yachts are available to the super rich in every corner of the seven seas, whenever they want. For the Yacht Express, its crew, and Captain Andre, it is mission accomplished. They see little of the paradises to which they deliver their precious cargo. On the horizon are the seven seas. The biggest. The heaviest. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's stuck on the track. The most. And the most expensive goods on Earth. Everything people can move. On land. On water. And in the air. Record-breaking, stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. If a transporter needs to be transported, if 176 wheels aren't enough to carry its weight, if the load weighs twice as much as the transporter, and only one thing counts, if it could be bigger, they would make it bigger. Then it must be the mother of all mega transports. The setting, Canada. The cargo, an ultra-class dump truck. The heroes, tough men with delicate fingers. Got to be really, really sensitive on the clutch and the brake. And eagle eyes. This mega transport will require everything from man and machine. Fort McKay in the province of Alberta. Large machines at work in a small industrial park. Here, mega transports are in their comfort zone. In the midst of this no man's land, the multinational company, Mammut, has built up a business for special transports. For there is treasure in this region, natural gas. To extract it, heavy machines are necessary. Mammut brings them from one refinery to another or uses cranes to hoist them out of mines day in, day out. But today is not like any other. Today is the day. At 4.30 a.m., Supervisor Nelson Moore briefs his seven-man team about the job, and the men get to work. The whole team has been looking forward to the upcoming mega transport for the last few weeks. The challenge is, it must be finished today. But the weather has conspired against the men. The rain overnight making everything wet for us, so we'll be working in the mud all day instead of the nice dry ground. Hauling in the mud costs extra time, time that the men do not have today. At least sun is forecast for the rest of the day. Hopefully that doesn't change and we get it by noon. Otherwise, it's just a mess with traffic if we have to go too much later. Nelson wants to avoid running the mega transport during rush hour at all costs. And this is the reason, today's load. It has spent the last two months 800 meters away, undergoing maintenance at a company called Finning. The service manager there, Kevin Unger, knows it inside and out. For he, 
personally oversaw every aspect of its maintenance in the last eight weeks. Here goes our shop. This is not an aircraft hangar. Although it sounds as if several dozen jet engines are running simultaneously, this is Kevin's workshop. This is where Finning takes apart huge construction machines one bolt at a time and rebuilds them. Heavy-duty cranes, excavators, and the biggest machine in the mining industry, the dump truck. This is Mammut's mega transport cargo for today. So at this shop here, we do mainly uh, repair, repairs of uh, mining equipment uh, and also complete rebuilds. Uh, this frame uh, here is a 797 frame where we completely tear it right down and completely build it back up to a running machine. It takes roughly about 3,700, 4,000 man hours. Every 50,000 operating hours, that is about every five years, the huge dump trucks must come for thorough servicing. Once the frame is completely stripped, it's right down to nothing on it, we then recondition it. We actually cut holes in the frame, we magnaflux it, we, we uh, NDT it, and then once it's all repaired and fixed, we assemble the frame back. Once all the hoses and harnesses and the valves are put back into the frame, then we actually start putting bigger components in. So the engine will go in. Once the engine goes in, the radiator, the radiator will go in, and then we start building the truck from there. It'll go up on stands. For safety reasons, we do try and do most of the work we can right down here on the ground. The frame alone weighs 210,000 kilograms. With all its parts, the dump truck weighs about 300 tons. And this is only the basic model. This is a 793 customer repair. We'll show you a bigger one. This is a little sister. This is the angry big brother. The 797, the biggest dump truck CAT has ever built, the workhorse of the North American mining industry. The record-breaking size of its wheels is matched only by that of its price, six to eight million dollars. This is the very truck that Mammut is supposed to deliver today to its operation site, an oil sand surface mine. So this is a 797, will haul 400 tons. Uh, the engine in this one here, we just repowered it to the new style C-175 engine but with uh, roughly 4,000 horsepower. If it could be bigger, they would make it bigger. Boys and their toys, come on. It's all about timing and how long it takes to move this amount of dirt to here so it can be processed. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's hard rock mining like in what we see in BC or if it's oil sands, it's how, how fast can we get this pile of dirt to the plant. And so either they have to have a lot more trucks or they have bigger trucks hauling more dirt. And so they find that the bigger trucks haul more dirt. Here in Canada's wilderness, everything is big. Not only the sky and the trucks. Under the ground in Alberta, there are enormous deposits of oil sands, heavy oil and bitumen. From these resources, the Canadian province produces about half a million barrels, or 80 million litres of crude oil a day. Two-thirds of the output goes to the United States. To get to these resources, billions of tonnes of sand, stone and gravel must be moved every day. The more, the better. Thus, each trip with a dump truck means more money earned and every break in the action is money lost. The dump trucks are therefore used around the clock. The 797 that has just come out of maintenance is supposed to be hauling rocks again tonight. For this to happen, it must somehow get to its place of work. It manages the 800 meters through the industrial park to Mammut's central office on its own power. For the rest of the way to the mine, on the highway, the 797 must be transported on a trailer. After about three kilometers, the mega transport must turn at a traffic light. Then it's straight ahead to the mine. 
So why doesn't the dump truck make the seven kilometer journey on its own wheels? There's no roads here that you could take this on the road, on the highway. Just, it's too big and it's too heavy. Because of the footprint of how the tires are here, all of that weight's on actually a small patch of ground. And the roads here aren't designed for that. And it's better in the wintertime when everything's frozen, but right now everything is soft. So this would leave quite the groove in the pavement if we're trying to drive in the summer times. With the truck's 300 tons distributed over only four wheels, the road would not be able to withstand the weight. Like an elephant standing on four juice boxes, the pressure on the four small patches of the ground would immediately burst the asphalt. Thus, transport companies must either reduce the weight of the load or distribute it. Usually, the dump trucks are dismantled with the bed, frame and wheels transported in seven individual trips and then reassembled at the end. But Mammut does it differently. It is the only company in the world that offers the so-called one-piece solution. And only this trailer makes it possible. The company's showpiece. 22 axles, each with eight wheels. Each axle hydraulically controlled and steered. To save the customer time and money, it carries dump trucks on its back in one piece, even the 797. The idea is to distribute its 300 tons across the 32 meter long trailer. But not even this length suffices to bear the dump truck's load. Not for nothing does the CAT 797 belong to the Ultra class, the all-star league of dump trucks. Supervisor Nelson Moore's men have already been working on the trailer for three hours, bolting, loading, riveting. Their goal, to make one trailer out of two. We bolt the two together and put an, uh, a front and header on and another panel on so that we can handle the extra weight. Andy will be my trailer operator today and then we've got three truck drivers and three pilot car drivers, four pilot car drivers. Whether it's an excavator, a crane or an auger, Mammut has a special trailer for each transport. The biggest one is necessary for the monster dump truck. Two of them, actually. And in point of fact, that means four. For the 32 meter long, 22 axle trailer actually has two parts. Thus, four trailers will be used for this mega transport. To make sure that everything runs smoothly, that the weight really is distributed equally, and that the trailer can even be steered, a special trailer operator is required. For three years now, Nelson has relied on Andy Holbeck, and he is only 29 years old. Well, my exposure limit two trailers. Good to go. Oil's got, uh, engine's got gas. Uh, it's running good and that all my valves are correct for my trailer. Otherwise we have issues, especially with the steering. So what happens is that steers the two steering cylinders in the front of the trailer, which then in turn moves all the tie rods. And when the front header moves with the oil, it does the exact opposite effect to the rear cylinders. Or I can split the trailer in the middle and then Paul just runs the front of the trailer. He steers the front half and then I steer the back half with this pad. It is just about impossible for one person to steer the 32-meter trailer around corners. If, for example, the tractor drives in reverse, the first part of the trailer responds normally. But the second part responds like a separate trailer, meaning it does the opposite of the first. Andy divides the trailer into two halves. In this way, he can help steer the back part by hand, thus maneuvering around obstacles. The trailer's hydraulics are another important factor in making the transport work without causing all kinds of damage. Youngster Andy takes over at the valves. Okay, good. 
I'm just checking my valve in, making sure that, um, making sure that it's set up so that each point, there's four points of the trailer, they're all independent so that you have balance. Otherwise, uh, a lot of ways, or a way to lose load would be to have your trailer in two point. So the front would all be one suspension. So when the oil drops, the way the oil moves is it's resistance, right? So if you were to go over a slope, the oil would move out of those cylinders because there's more resistance there and it would move to the other side of the trailer. And if it was in two point, it would just keep going because it would get heavier and heavier and then you'd lose your load. The hydronics keep all four parts of the trailer level at all times. For example, if one side dries over a bump or a tire goes flat, then that side would sink down. With a 300 ton load, only a few centimeters of unevenness can suffice to make everything lurch and even tip over. Andy would prefer not to think about what could happen in such a scenario. While he checks each of the 352 tires for air pressure, 800 meters away at Finning, the big moment has come. The dump truck on which dozens of individuals have been working on for two months is finally ready to be handed over. This is always quite an event for the employees. All of them come to the launch. Twelve horsepower are used for the ignition. That's how much the starter has all by itself. The driver has to be extra careful while backing through the gate. He can't see what's going on behind the truck at all. And even worse, he wouldn't even notice if he ran over his colleague. The 797 is supposed to be back hauling rocks tonight. After that, it will be in use around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Only a moving dump truck is a good dump truck, until it is time for the next complete overhaul from Kevin Unger. It's cool though, because we built that, right? It's like a big Tonka toy. I don't know if you had ton Tonka toys when you, were, uh, when you were kids. That's all it is. A rather expensive toy, and heavy, and thirsty, and big. Here on the lot, the 797's true size can finally be appreciated, the Ultra Caterpillar. 9.75 meters wide, 7.7 .7 meters high, and 15.08 meters long. The tank holds 3,785 liters of fuel. It must be refilled every 12 hours. It's six wheels of four meters high. One alone costs $42,000 and weighs 20 tons. The 797 can load about 400 tons, more than its own weight. It could transport 200 mid-size station wagons. Only today, it is not the mega transporter, but rather the mega transport cargo. Somehow, the mammoth workers have to get it into the mine. It is noon. The first step has only just been taken. Andy has checked all the tires and valves, and now he can join the two trailers together. 625 tons on the hitch. This monster will get it moving. The Western Star 6900 Extreme Duty. With 600 horsepower, it seems feeble in comparison with the 797. But its 16-gear manual transmission makes the truck a sensitive workhorse. When an experienced jockey rides it, a man like Paul Brophy. He and Andy have to join the individual trailer pieces together to make one big trailer. While Paul drives the truck and the first trailer, Andy manually steers the back sections in the opposite direction. This is the only way to control the $2.2 million trailer. 
the hardest part. In order to be joined, the trailers have to be lined up at exactly the same point, right next to one another and exactly parallel. I'm going to take a little bit off and just go straight from there. We'll uh, get another set of eyes up front before we get too close. Yeah, I'm here, Andy. Oh, Ken, okay, poor Ken. Okay. If Paul and Andy don't line up the second trailer exactly parallel with the first, they'll have to start all over again. One centimeter of distance at the front can mean a whole meter at the back. They're looking good so far, Paul. You've got about a four inch gap at the back here and you got six lines to go. Like when buying and assembling a bike, a bookshelf or a grill, trouble starts right away when the holes are pre-drilled but the last screw doesn't fit because the hole is one centimeter off. The situation everyday people know from the hardware store now threatens to stymie the two experts in XXL dimensions. For even with a 32-meter trailer, every millimeter counts in the end. Here too, the last bolt might not fit. Yeah, you're still looking good, Paul. You got about three lines to go. Just gonna start touching on the front. All right, hold that pole for a sec. Uh, it's touching now there, Kev. All right, might have to take a little bit off. Well, we might get it. Okay, going ahead, pro feet, we got five feet. Something is not right. What do you need, Andy? The trailers are lined up to the same point and everything looks good at the front. But as feared, the trailer is the tiniest bit askew. So at the back, holes and bolts don't match up anymore. The mega trailer won't come together like that. Taking direction from Nelson, Paul and Andy must now make adjustments, one millimeter at a time. Pretty precise, yeah. Um, you can have a little gap. What we'll do is we're gonna put them together. We'll get the bolts as tight as we can. We'll back the trailer up and I'll just steer this one them together a bit and it should tighten them up and then we can get the bolts fairly tight. There, it's a lot of work for seven kilometers, right? Still, this method is cheaper and faster than transporting the dump truck in individual pieces. And Paul gets it right after a few attempts. Got to be really, really sensitive on the clutch and the brake. So it's, yeah, precise. As long as the trailer sections are moving, the men can't bolt them together. The danger of being crushed is too big. Oh, we'll try to bolt there. Okay, don't move, we got hands in here. Okay, put top, top end, or both tops in, or whatever you can fill. That looks really good, guys. We'll start at the front and work our way back, and that way we can follow the camber of the trailer. We find a we put them in, put them in. Put them in. <laughs> it may look easy, but it's dangerous. Often enough, there have been terrible accidents at such moments. Yeah, the teamwork is incredibly important here because in here you could lose a finger pretty easy if you're not talking to the operator and communicating with somebody. Everything goes fine today. No crushed fingers. But the operation took longer than planned. The men are already one hour behind schedule, and the true challenges are still far ahead. Although, one lies right around the corner. As far as challenging goes, it'd be pulling this truck. Um, that first corner here is pretty tight. But it will be some time before the men finish bolting the mega trailer together. 
And how is the 797 Ultra Dump Truck ever supposed to get on top of it? For the solution to this problem, the team now pulls the trailer away from the lot. The 797 cannot simply drive onto the back. That would be like 600 elephants jumping on the last row of wheels at once. That would be quite a sight, but it's not an option. Not even with the utmost care and a long ramp would it work. Mammut's engineers have thought of something better, a solution unique around the world, the mobile jacker platform. A frame that can lift itself, even with a dump truck's weight on top, only not very high. But it doesn't have to go high. This is how it works. Jack in each corner, and basically you build a pit pile. Um, it, it's only got four inches of stroke at a time. So we build it like this, we put a piece of plywood on the other side, and the frame comes down. Um, it all sits flush, it sits in the plywood, so it hangs just above. And then we pull the center blocks out, and then you drive the jack down, and it lifts the outsides up. Then we peel the outsides out, and then we're back to the flat again and then it's just rinse and repeat. And then we come down four inches at a time. You'll see kind of when As simple as it is brilliant, but tedious. So that they do not collapse underneath the dump truck, the jacks in the corners can only extend 10 centimeters. Andy and his colleagues build a kind of support tower, levels of which can be added or subtracted at will. At first, it is high, so that the trailer can drive out from underneath. Then, it is lowered bit by bit, so that the dump truck can drive onto it. Once the 797 is secure, the platform is raised back up piece by piece. The trailer slides underneath, and the miracle platform is lowered again. That's the plan. A plan that Nelson, the supervisor, now puts into action. He gets the 797 from the finning lot, where the dump truck stands ready with the key in the ignition and the motor running. Stealing this eight meter high monster and getting away with it unseen would be difficult, even in Canada. No special license is necessary to drive the biggest cat dump truck. Whoever is qualified to drive normal construction machines may also drive in the Ultra class. The very first thing Nelson does is extremely important, opening and closing the 14 meter long bed. Better safe than sorry. Nelson does not know that the 797 has just been driven out of the dry hangar. I don't know how long the truck's been sitting outside. So if it's that out there, it's a couple of rainstorms, it could have a lot of water in this one. It's a chance for it to get sloshed. With a volume of 213 cubic meters, every small steering motion would mean an enormous shift in weight. That's how Nelson likes to think of it. But with a 42 meter turning radius, restricted vision, and no feeling of contact with the road, moving this gigantic toy is nothing like driving an SUV to the supermarket. It'd be a fun truck to drive, I think, for a short term. I can't, I couldn't handle it for long term. You know, everybody thinks, well, it's a big way to go, but it'd be a pretty boring to go up for a short term. Some people love it. They would. A lot of them, people. That's all they ever want to do is drive all types. Interestingly, most companies have women drive the dump trucks because they are gentler on the gears and the hydraulics. Understandable at a retail price of up to eight million euros. The worst part is getting used to how far over that way it is. After all, 
the other external mirror is more than nine meters away. No wonder the transport company has to join two trailers side by side in order to transport this monster. The 797 is quite fast. Even fully loaded, it can reach a high speed of 67 kilometers per hour. But that's not the only thing that impresses everyone else on the road. Once in motion, the 797 needs special brakes to slow down. A total of 25 brake discs, each with a diameter of 1.06 meters, brake the mega dump truck hydraulically. So that no tour buses get caught under the wheels, for example. p.m. On the Mammut lot, the workers have spent the last several hours bolting the 32-meter trailers together. This 325-ton mega trailer is slated to bring the 797 dump truck to the mine today. But for that, it needs the jack-up platform. Meanwhile, Andy and his colleagues have unloaded it. It is lying flat on the ground. Nelson only has to drive onto it over two long ramps. This is also only possible with teamwork. From the cab, Nelson cannot see at all where he needs to steer. Everything two to three meters in front of his wheels is in a blind spot. If Andy has Nelson drive one centimeter too far to the left, right, front or back, it translates later into a weight difference on the trailer sections of several tons. And that could cause the whole trailer to tip over. The hardest part, balancing the rear axle on the platform with 4,000 horsepower rear wheel drive. If you don't kind of finesse it up there, it'll just spin the mouth out from underneath the truck. And it'll the rear end. It's a, it's a traction control system. You push that button and it locks the rear end. With lots of feeling, visual judgment, timing and teamwork, the 797 is in perfect position in only a few minutes and not a moment too soon. Park brake is on. Actually, the mega transport should have been on its way to the mine long ago. But the work in the morning took longer than planned. The men whose job it is to remove the traffic lights along the way are already waiting. Good day, sir. Good day, everybody. Good, sounds like you're in your office chilling out or something. Two, yeah, 3.30, 4 o'clock, we shouldn't be too far out of line. A two-hour delay. In the transport business here in Canada's mining country, no big deal. Still, the 797 is not yet on the trailer. First, the platform has to be raised up bit by bit, and then 
brought back down onto the trailer. So Paul, the driver, has to maneuver the trailer, 32 meters long and 9 meters wide, under the 9.4 meter wide platform. A difficult reverse parking maneuver times 10, so to speak, with only a few centimeters of leeway. I gotta hit the mark. So, yeah. Sometimes, it, see, that's the mark. He's gonna put that mark on the trailer, or on the frame. I can't see where, the, where he's putting the mark, right? Somebody else will be back there at the radio and tell me what to, to do, you know, right or left. Or, and hopefully we can get it first time, I hope. I hope. <laughs> What can go wrong? Huh? Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> you know, the mammoth. <laughs> For mammoth, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> okay, I got it back up. Meanwhile, Nelson, the supervisor, has taken charge of the advance party in one of the pilot pickups. We check the path, our, our route for today's move just to make sure we got no obstructions or any new highway signs they put up or construction signs or any obstacles that will give us any stress today. Although the mega transport takes up almost the entire width of the road, the route is not closed down. For Highway 63 is the lifeline of the region. It connects the mines with the towns and the commercial areas. The men themselves are responsible for safety and normal traffic continues to flow. Once we get on the road, the challenging part is the other traffic for the most part. Just keeping them safe, basically, because not only do we have to move our load safe, we have to keep the public safe, whether we are stopping them so that we can safely pass them or just moving them over and slowing them down so we can safely pass. Another challenge, an intersection with traffic lights. The nine meter high transport cannot possibly pass beneath them. Nelson has to make sure that the light is turned aside at just the right moment. Otherwise, the mega transport would block the whole highway. The height of these ones, we keep track of everything in our area. The height of these is only 6.2 meters. Like, and today with the haul truck on, we're at 9.75 meters high. So we'll get the light turners out because they own the lights and it's their job to spin them. So basically they just pull the two pins that are holding and they'll stick a big bar in here and then they'll open it up because we were so wide and so high. I think it's a set number right now per light, but if we make them wait because of whether it's on our part or the client's part that we had to wait for the, the equipment, yeah, then he charges by the, a little more. <laughs> The transport has to get moving now, and not only for financial reasons. It is already 4 p.m. In one hour, rush hour begins for the mine workers. At all costs, Paul and Andy must now secure the load and get the mega transport on the road. Driving on an open highway during rush hour would be too dangerous. Almost all the mines and refineries in the area work around the clock in a three-shift system. The day shift ends right between 5 and 6. That means the highway fills up suddenly in both directions. Paul does not have time for many attempts at his difficult parking maneuver. And in fact, he gets it on the very first try. The trailer is under the platform. Now the team only has to lower the platform onto the trailer and finally secure the load. 4.30 in the afternoon in Alberta. Everything is lashed down. Andy briefs the team one last time. Everyone must know what they are supposed to do and when and where they should do it. The 29-year-old is responsible for making sure the trailer is up to the job's extreme demands. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to get this thing there so we can take it off and go home, right? It's been a long day so far. Well, not quite. It'll be 12 hours and a half an hour, so. And then we still got to unload. It'll probably be a 15, 16 hour day. 
be a good day. I mean, I'm not complaining about the paycheck next week, but right now I'm not too stuck about it. Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna get this thing through the gate now, and then, uh, yeah. After 12 hours of preparation, the mega transport finally leaves the lot. Paul pulls the load of more than 600 tons with his 600 horsepower diesel engine. It's like having 14 mid-range airplanes attached to his trailer hitch. The drivers in the two trucks pushing from the back give a little help to get started. They'll push again later when the route goes uphill and they can help break if needed. Right now, Paul needs them above all as extra eyes. Except for something big and yellow, he can barely see anything in his rearview mirror. Nelson forms the vanguard in the pickup. Everyone on the team, whether in the front or in the back, communicates via walkie-talkie. The mega transport merges onto Highway 63 shortly before 5 p.m. And Paul steps on the accelerator right away. He blasts down the highway with a mega transport at over 40 kilometers per hour, with 600 tons of steel on his back. You gotta pay attention all the time. It's a lot behind you, right? But they have good pilots, they keep an eye for me. So they watch all around all the time. So that's good. You gotta trust them guys. Because I can't see everything, right? So you have to really trust those guys to watch for you. What is more, Paul must have faith above all that the men will stop the traffic coming from ahead and behind, or at least try. Many drivers disregard the warning lights and stop signs and simply keep on driving. Nelson has had some crazy experiences. Some days they couldn't be any better, they'll just pull over and keep moving, and then the odd day you'll get people, especially with something like this, is big and grandiose they'll stop and they want to take pictures and videos not remembering that there's people coming up behind them at you know 50 and 60 miles an hour and that's where it gets scary because you know whether people are distracted or not coming down the highway and they're not watching There's a lot of traffic on the driver's side here Andy and four yeah I see them right now you got a good line on them Paul and I wouldn't go any more to your swamper or else you'll kind of be hanging off the pavement. Speak of the devil. An entire caravan has ignored the signs on the route and has entered the highway. Some get out of their cars, take pictures. Others just keep driving. Paul must make room, keep as far to the right as possible, but not too far. If he hits the gravel on the side of the road, it could endanger the whole load. A dicey situation, but Paul stays calm. It's not bad, you just gotta pay attention. It's almost impossible to believe but the trucking pro has been in situations like this on Canada's highways in which a car has tried to pass from behind. After 100 meters, the caravan has gone by and the first danger is surpassed, but the next is already waiting. The mega transport has to turn right at this traffic light but despite the blockade, cars are still careening down the road. And regardless of all planning, the traffic light is still hanging over the lane and is thus in Paul's way. The traffic light service is there, but he does not turn the poles to the side in time. This mere 30 second delay is enough, 
Paul must break quickly with 600 tons on his back, thus blocking the whole highway. To manage the situation, Nelson quickly takes care of the traffic light and plays traffic cop. He regulates the traffic like a pro until everything is safe. Only then can the mega transport get back on the move. Paul also makes the right turn with the utmost precision. Here in Canada's mining region, special transport drivers and trailer operators like Paul and Andy earn good money. $5,000 a week is not rare. It seems like a dream job, and yet many beginners quit very quickly. Lots of kids want to come to work here, but the experience is the hard part for them. If you think you're coming to work here to be a truck driver, some of them do, but it's a lot of, in our region, a lot of labor intensive work. Most of the workers in the area come from all over Canada and the United States. They work eight or nine months here around the clock, and then they treat themselves to several months of off time. The cost of this extremely laborious and only seven kilometer long mega transport varies and is an industry secret. But one thing is certain. In the end, it is considerably cheaper for the mine operator and owner than taking the 797 apart and transporting it in seven individual trips. Thanks to the one-piece solution, the truck will be working away again tonight. Yeah, it went great. No issues. Everything went smooth. Um, except aside for waiting for curfew yesterday, I kind of sucked. But... After 16 hours, Nelson's men have finished the job. The mega dump truck is back in the mine. For the workers, though, the day is not yet done. The ultra class dump truck still has to be taken off the platform. It is the same tedious procedure used during loading, only backwards. Raise the platform, lower the platform, and then the 797 can finally enter the mine. Nelson, the supervisor, is satisfied. His men have worked well together as a team all day and have brought the mega transport safely to the mine. The only thing that dampens his mood are the numerous gawkers. They never seem to get used to it, and it's actually a hindrance for us because everybody's paying attention to what they're doing on their phone and taking pictures or jumping out of their vehicles and taking videos. And it becomes a hindrance because there's still traffic. They forget there's still traffic coming behind them. That we didn't have any big obstacles today. We didn't have any mud or anything to deal with, so we had a great day. From now on, the 797 will be working around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nelson and his team want to get home quickly now, for the next mega transport is tomorrow morning at 8, on the highways of Alberta. The biggest. The heaviest. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's stuck on the track. The most. And the most expensive goods on Earth. Everything people can move. On land. On water. And in the air. Record-breaking 
stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. Norwegian Joy is the world's fourth largest cruise ship. At 333 meters long and with a nearly 42 meter beam, she is a true giant of the seas. We're going to lower the harbor gate now. Its 20 decks can accommodate 3,850 passengers. Her voyage from the shipyard to the sea is a logistical triumph. A carefully rehearsed spectacle with delicate movements reminiscent of a ballet. We've opened it, you can move out. Wind and weather, draft and tide, a 50 kilometer trip down a river lies ahead of the Norwegian Joy. To come through it unscathed, everything must work properly. With as yet unseen onboard attractions, the Norwegian Joy is one of the most innovative ships of its era, but even the smallest mistake could cause this ocean giant to falter. This is where everything begins, Meyerwerft in Papenburg. This shipyard builds some of the world's largest cruise ships, but it has a problem as big as the ships it builds. The coast and sea are 50 kilometers away. The only route leading there is the Ems. Every mile worth ship has to negotiate this channel to make its way to the North Sea. And this is where they are built, in the north of Germany. Shipbuilding has a long tradition here in Papenburg. From here, the shallow and narrow Ems meanders past places like Wiener, Leer and Emden. This river is actually entirely unsuitable for conveying gigantic cruise ships. 50 kilometers to the North Sea. They are the most difficult the Norwegian Joy will ever travel. March 2017. For 11 months, the Norwegian Joy has been taking shape here in Papenburg. To date, it is the biggest ship ever built here. Down below on the dry dock, the final touches are being put on the hull. In a few days, the dock will be flooded and the ocean giant will leave the yard. Chief mechanical engineer Hermann Vessels is responsible for fitting the propulsion system, which also includes what are called maneuvering thrusters. We sometimes even use them on the M's, and we've already tested these systems here. On the M's, we use them to do some steering maneuvers, particularly before coming up to critical spots like bridges and the M's barrier. The thrusters allow the Norwegian Joy to move sideways, extremely important during her first kilometers. The primary sources of propulsion are two 200-ton azipods below the stern. Each of these gigantic pods has five propeller blades with a diameter of nearly six meters. These workers are just filling in holes with massive metal plugs. They needed the holes to mount the 20-ton propeller. Now, they would reduce its efficiency. As the conveyance date edges closer, the pressure grows on the fitters to complete all of their tasks with the utmost precision. Now more than ever, what counts is perfection. Making improvements to the propellers on the high seas, inconceivable. That's why Chief Mechanical Engineer Hermann Vessels repeatedly checks every blade on every propeller. Uh, 
Since the propeller will ultimately be the main thing that propels the ship, and because it is very sensitive as far as vibrations are concerned, we really have to make sure that it has no flaws or damages on it. The golden yellow aluminium bronze gleams flawlessly, as it should. Hermann Vessels and his team are proud of what they've accomplished. Every ship is absolutely unique, and I would say that most of what happens on these ships, especially with the hull, the plates, the sections and the blocks, most of that is still done by hand. You can't even imagine how much sweat and work has gone into this day in and day out. Hermann Vessel's work on the Norwegian Joy is finished. Inside the ship, the work is far from over. Project manager Torsten Kroos is responsible for overseeing the timely delivery of the cruise ship to the cruise line company. Until then, he has quite a few things to take care of on board. For example, the theater. If it were up to Kroos, it would be a while longer until the curtain goes up for the first time here. The whole thing takes about three years, and over those three years, I supervise the ship's construction. And at the end of the day, when we hand over the ship to the customer, parting with it is a bit sad, and that is quite a stirring moment. But inevitably, it will come. Delivery dates are unforgiving. The schedule now demands that the ship goes out onto the Ems, whether it is finished on the inside or not. It still looks pretty barren here. We're still in the construction phase. Of course, things don't always go smoothly during a project like this, and we still have a few minor problems here and there. One week later, in an hour, the Ems will flood the dry dock. Conveyance of the Norwegian Joy begins. But before the Norwegian Joy heads out on its maiden voyage, she has to leave dry dock too, where she was constructed over the last 11 months. More than 200,000 cubic meters of water flow into the world's biggest covered dock, enough to fill 80 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Then, a tiny tugboat takes over. It must guide the gigantic cruise ship very precisely out of the hall and into the harbor basin. In order to make it possible to undock the nearly finished ocean giant at all, water from the Ems has to enter the shipyard's basin. The ship can only float out if the water level is at maximum depth. In less than one hour, the access gates to the harbor basin and thus the dry dock will open. There, several lifting platforms are still awaiting removal. Until recently, they were being used to work on the hull. One after the other, they hover out of the dock. Department head Ralph Berlager and dock master Heine Nee are responsible for flooding the dock. One final check. Yes, final inspection is at 11 o'clock with the shipping company. Yes. And then we can start flooding it. Then we'll get started. All right. Lifting platforms, machines, tools, people. Before flooding the dock, everything must be removed from the danger zone. Ralph Berlager and Heine Nee are responsible for getting everyone out of the dock, especially here at the inlet to the basin, for soon water will enter here. It'll come in this opening, and the other opening is back there. So that's four square meters where water will flow into the dock, so you wouldn't be able to stand here anymore. How many cubic meters are we bringing in here? 200,000 cubic meters. And that takes about three hours, so you can imagine the sheer mass of water that comes in here and the pressure it flows in with. The final inspection is pressure-packed as well. This is when the cruise liner company inspects the hull of the ship. Project manager Torsten Kroos cannot start the flooding of the dock unless the inspection ends complaint-free. 
Of course, there's the opportunity to make a few touch-ups if we find anything wrong with the color, or if we think we haven't done a good job on a grade. There are a few possibilities to fix things, but not if it's anything major. If the company's inspectors were to find major issues, everything would have to be stopped here. But after a 30-minute inspection, they get the all clear. Everything is signed and approved. Thumbs up, we passed the test. There were no complaints about the hull, and we can start the flooding. Now, absolutely everyone has to leave. The last person to do so is the dock master himself, Heiner Nee. Yes, helmet, open the valves. The building dock is 480 meters long and 45 meters wide. After only a few minutes, the floor is flooded completely. After half an hour, the water has reached the hull. And after two hours, it is nearly finished. The water level has to exceed eight meters, so the Norwegian Joy can float for the first time. Fifty kilometers to the open sea. And only a few minutes until the first big obstacle for Norwegian Joy. The undocking process. The next day at six in the morning, Shipyard captain Wolfgang Tors is on his way to the bridge, the command center of the Norwegian Joy. He will direct the undocking process from there. His main focus is now on the draft. Of course, I look at the drafts. We have a good meter. It'll be similar out on the ends later. When the ship is moving, that will all certainly change a bit. The ship is not carrying a full load now. That will change by the time we convey the ship. So she is further out of the water now than she will be when we convey her. The greatest danger is running aground. To keep the ocean-going giant from scraping on the dock, the captain will have to rely on the help of a Dutch tugboat. The engine of the Norwegian Joy generates more than 100,000 horsepower. It could badly damage the dock. So it's better if a tug takes over the reins for the first few meters. Even if it doesn't look like it, its 1,000 horsepower are plenty to pull the mammoth ship into open water. Shipyard captain Wolfgang Tuls is happy with the drafts and heads toward the bridge. It occupies the entire bow area of the ship on deck 14. This area is still a construction site as well. However, the instruments Tuls and his team need to undock are already functional. Although not on board, Heiner Nee is also part of that team. Heiner to Hans Tamman. Heinz, are you ready up front? We're going to take the footbridge away now, and then the command will come from the bridge when we are ready to go. Here in the dock, we'll refrain from using the ship's engines. In the tugboat, Gruno 4 will tow the ship alone. With a single tow rope. The tugboat warms up. Then, the command from the bridge of Norwegian Joy, untie the ropes.
Also die Leinen sind alle so weit. The ropes have all been untied. He's now trying to get the ship moving slowly with the tug. And it takes a good while to get all those tens of thousands of tons moving. Nothing happens. At first. But then. We're moving. There's no turning back now. 11 months after the start of construction, the Norwegian Joy is finally moving for the very first time. It pulls out, backwards, stern forward. Only a meter and a half of space remains to the left and right. Even the smallest divergence and the ship would immediately bang against the dock walls. It could even be tight on the ceiling. On the topmost deck, there is the new prize piece, the water slide. The critical point is that glass slide up there leaving the dock entrance. That's going to be darn tight. The chunky stern has to exit the covered dock first. The slide is in the middle of the 333 meter long ship. Heine Nee doesn't take his eye off it for even a second. That looks good. The slide is through. Daniel! But now, things are getting tight portside. Two more tugs assist to keep the Norwegian Joy from ramming into the gate of the covered dock. The three tugs pull the ocean giant to starboard. After more than one hour, they've managed it. The Norwegian Joy has safely reached the shipyard harbor. Right now, we're in the position that we need according to the plan, so bring it in. There is no time to celebrate. Works must be completed on the pier that the men were unable to carry out inside due to the low ceiling. Martin, the tugs are pushing on the other side, right? Is it okay for you guys if we put the footbridge on? Can we put the funnel into place now? Okay, then. Good. Then we're done here. The ship is in position. The funnel can be fitted. Two cranes have been set up specifically for that task. They raise the over 80-ton funnel onto the topmost deck. Exhaust from the engines is emitted from the funnel and directed well over the ship. This is where the ventilation system for the Norwegian Joy is located. Once the funnel has been fitted, the first stage of the pending conveyance is complete. The works in the yard's harbor will take three weeks. Now people can finally admire the attractions. A laser tag arena, two pools, two slides, and a first, a go-kart track. All of those perks are meant to attract customers, especially from Asia, to come on a cruise. That's because Beijing and Shanghai will be Norwegian Joy's home ports. She is the fourth largest cruise ship in the world and the largest to have ever been built in Papenburg. She is already afloat, 
but it'll be a while before she's sailing the seas. Before she does that, she has to pass through the Ems barrier in Gandersholm. The normal water level of the Ems is roughly six meters, too little to convey a cruise ship the size of the Norwegian Joy. That means the river has to be raised to at least eight and a half meters, just a little over the ship's draft of eight meters and 40 centimeters. The water level of the Ems is the biggest question mark that arises during every passage through the Ems barrier. In exactly 24 hours, the Norwegian Joy is scheduled to cast off from Pappenberg. By then, Reinhard Backer has to ensure the water level reaches at least eight and a half meters. He is the head of operations at Ems Barrier in Gandersum. The next high tide is expected at 11 p.m. Hello, Susan. Hello, everybody. Hi. So, are you ready? Backer and his team want to capture the water from the tide, dam up the Ems with it, and hold it in the river until the Norwegian Joy has passed through the barrier. This is now our 35th conveyance. Every conveyance is different. The conditions here are different every time, whether it's the tide, the wind coming from somewhere or another, or the headwater. For example, rain, visibility, and fog can cause terrible problems. The problem is, Closing the barrier alone will not suffice to raise the water level nearly three meters above normal. The men have to hope that the Ems itself will carry enough water flow towards the sea. Closing the lock gates at just the right time is essential. Okay, okay start the main shipping gate. The main shipping gate is a 60 meter wide opening. Right at the tide's high point, Backer gives the order to close it. The lock gate is set in motion. But Backer knows, this time, it won't be enough water. We do have a pump system in the structure with a mid-level capacity of 100 cubic meters a second. That is a whole lot. But we won't be able to manage it with the pump alone. And because there's not much headwater at the moment, we can't be sure if we'll actually have enough water by Monday at noon so the ship can pass through, or if we'll have to wait another 12 hours. Waiting 12 more hours for the next high tide and thus more headwater would put everything behind schedule. Before it has even begun, Norwegian Joy's Ems passage is already looking questionable. Despite all of the efforts to dam up enough water, the boat could run aground at the barrier. But low water levels aren't the only threat to the conveyance. On her way to the North Sea, the Norwegian Joy must pass two bridges. Passage in those spots will be extremely tight. Back at the shipyard, time has finally come. The start of the conveyance has been postponed from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. due to the low water level. So the Ems had another eight hours to amass enough depth. Dockmaster Heinen Nee takes up position. He is responsible for the smooth passage through the first bottleneck, the dock lock gate. The Norwegian Joy has to get past here. We'll open the final gate when the ship's crew gives us the OK to bring in the tugs. Then we'll open it. Another two hours until things get started. Super strong tugboats from Hamburg are supposed to tow the Norwegian Joy down the Ems. But they must wait outside the dock lock gate. The M still needs a few more centimeters of depth before the ocean giant can venture out onto the river. But there is something else to worry about for Heine and Nee. The structure has a clear width of 44.5 meters, and the ship's beam is 41 meters and 40 centimeters, so there isn't too much space on either side. Roughly one meter and a half on each side. It is Captain Wolfgang Tors who will have to cope with it. In an hour and a half, the transit is supposed to begin. Four weeks before the handover, there is still lots left to do. However, the bridge is fully operational. The ship can be piloted from several command centers. This one is the most important. 
Our true command center is here, as in the middle, we have basically converted all the systems here somewhat for transit. You can see looking at this makeshift solution here, made with wood, these levers are normally back here, but they do us no good there. That's why we make it all a bit more convenient for us, because we'll be traveling backwards at least to Emden. We have reconstructed these controls to meet our needs. These two levers control our azipods, our two main propulsion units, which can be rotated 360 degrees. And we control our three maneuvering thrusters with just this one lever here. A state-of-the-art satellite-based navigation system allows the captain to steer the Norwegian Joy blindly. It basically makes no difference if we're traveling at day or night. Not even the thickest fog would bother us because we pilot entirely using instruments. The tracking systems are much more accurate than GPS and show the ship's position down to the nearest centimeter. The captain is only worried about fire safety. In case we have an issue, this is also the command center for all firefighting measures. The ship's plans are here and will be hanging here later. We can deal with each individual case using them, but knock on wood, nothing has happened in a long time. While going through the lock gate, the worst thing that could happen would be the ship running aground. The water depth in the shipyard harbor is too low, only 7 meters 35 centimeters. Outside the gate, the water level is already 7 meters 55 centimeters. The next hours are crucial. There's no going back. We have to go through. The water level of the Ems continues to increase to 8 meters. And that means time to go. Push the button. To the Bridge of the Joy, do you read me? Yes, we're going to lower the harbor gate now and send the tugs right over to you. A pulley system is employed to lower the harbor gate, so it rests on the bottom of the lock. Heine is tense. In the worst case, it could get jammed on the way down. Then finally, the all clear. Then you'll let the tugs know they can enter, right? Without the two tugs, conveying a ship of this size would be impossible. Unlike during the undocking process, these two tongues do more than tug and tow. They will work like two outboard engines to maneuver the Norwegian Joy down the Ems. Both tugs are hooked up to her, one in the front and one in the back. Both of them can run at a maximum power output of 13,000 horsepower. That sounds like a lot, but the gigantic cruise liner is 333 meters long. Yes, did you hear that? Hunthorns out of the water, please. Yep. It is 300 meters from the pier to the dock lock. The Norwegian joy needs nearly 30 minutes which makes it 10 times faster than a snail. One meter and a half to the left and to the right. The dock lock is the most difficult narrow passage on the way to the North Sea. Simply floating through won't work. The pilots slowly inch their way closer. They are aiming for these metal structures. Stadtwalder bei 80 und 
Instead of going through the very middle, they pilot the giant ocean liner to the far right of the lock, onto these rollers. The ship will now rest against those wheel fenders and will then be able to move out of the lock. The pilots use the wheel fenders. They are made of plastic and move when the ship passes by them. The ship is most truly on the safe side. With the help of this contraption, the Norwegian Joy safely passes through the lock without a scratch. It is from this bird's eye view that one can see how truly tight a fit it is. It is tight on the left side as well, although the ship is pressed up against the wheel fender. Every centimeter counts. It is over halfway through. Now the ship is in the right position. It's a lovely feeling when you know you can depend on people who work together to make sure the conveyance gets done no matter what position they're in. They've overcome the narrowest section of the dock gate. But now things are tied below the water. On the Ems, the Norwegian Joy has just 10 centimeters of water under the keel. That takes a load off your mind. We've managed to this point and have done everything well up to now. Now let's see what the rest of the trip brings with it. Heinen Nier's work is done now. He has directed the Norwegian Joy out onto the Ems. But for project manager Torsten Kroos, the conveyance adventure is far from over. Of course it is an exciting moment. The shipyard is now behind us, and we are out of the shipyard harbor for the first time. Everything is working. It's going well. We're on target. Of course, you're nervous about whether everything will work out, but up until now, everything is going great. But the Ems has a few more hurdles in store. Seven kilometers downriver, a destroyed railway bridge Passage width here, just 48 meters. The next hurdle, the Jan Berghaus Bridge in Leer. Its long bridge flap does not go entirely vertical and could collide with the top deck. Finally, the Ems barrier in Gandersum. The Norwegian Joy cannot pass through until the water level has reached at least eight meters. The ship has the first kilometers on the Ems behind it. As if pulled on a string, the Norwegian Joy makes its way through the darkness, traveling stern first the entire time. We convey the ship backwards, stern first. The advantage of that is that we scoop up water through the propulsion units below the keel, and the ship is easier to maneuver. Because the propulsion units are in front, the entire length of the ship is in front of us, so to speak, which allows us to control the ship better. Having that extra control is especially important when passing through the Vena railway bridge. In December 2015, a freighter rammed into a bridge pier and destroyed the main section of the bridge. Since then, the bridge has been out of commission and is not lit up at night. The weather on this night is especially bad. Thick fog hovers over the Ems. The ship is barely recognizable. The banks and the bridge are not visible from on board the ship. The Norwegian Joy appears to be feeling its way ahead blindly. 
It is only with the assistance of its precise, ultra-modern navigation instruments that it manages the blind passage through the bridge ruins. But the biggest test still lies ahead of the Norwegian joy. The passage to the Ems barrier in Gandersum. Will the water level be high enough for the ocean giant to maneuver safely into the North Sea? But first, the next hurdle. The heavily trafficked Jan Berghaus Bridge. In 2010, the Meyer Werft had it reconstructed specifically to allow large ships to pass. 56 meters wide sounds easy, but the long bridge flap does not go up to vertical and juts out into the shipping channel. A tight squeeze for the water slide. From the control tower, the Norwegian joy should be easy to see, even at night. Normally it is. But tonight, bridgemen Dennis Harms and Thomas Pertke need their instruments assistance. The fog is too thick. Norwegian Joy, leverage here. You've passed 13. We'll prepare to open the bridge. There was a collision at Wiener Bridge. And we're always afraid something like that could happen here. Well, no one is on the carriageway. Looking good. Then let's go. This will be a cloak and dagger operation. The uneasiness grows. Now the navigation skills of the men on board are decisive. Norwegian joy. Leverage to Norwegian Joy. Right, the bridge is completely raised and locked. It's open for your passage. Till soon. Have a good trip. It's quite interesting that you can't do much more. We've just handed over responsibility. The bridge is open and we're waiting for what's to come. Something's coming. Through the fog. Must be gigantic. Will it be enough for the slide on the upper deck to clear? It juts out about four meters over the railing and could therefore get smashed by the long bridge flap. Aboard, project manager Torsten Kroos can only hope and pray. That we manage to get through it with the slide intact and don't graze it with the slide and can move on, so to speak. The ship is traveling very fast at this point. Avoiding the flap at the last moment would be impossible. Crazy, isn't it? The bridgemen have no clue how little leeway there is on the upper deck. Oh. Yes, it's just a few centimeters. We're through. Cool. cool. Getting the slide through was the diciest part of the passage for the Norwegian Joy. The rest is no problem, thanks to the 56 meter width of the channel. The Norwegian Joy heads onward, apparently unfazed and unbothered. Torsten Kroos breathes a sigh of relief. Sure, you're so excited about it and work so hard for it. And when it's finally time and it works out as well as it did now, of course, it's ideal. Four in the morning, Norwegian Joy heads towards the sea. 
Even from a distance, it causes headaches for the Norwegian joy. Ebb and flow from the North Sea raises and lowers the water level in the Ems. The barrier has to ensure a constant water depth of 8 meters. When high tide is reached, the gates are closed. For the ship's passage, the water level in front of and behind the lock cannot be more than 10 centimeters different. If it is, the huge cruise ship will start to roll. Ten hours have passed since the ship sent out from Pattenburg. The fog on the Ems recedes, but it sticks around persistently near the barrier. The director of the Ems barrier, Reinhard Backer, monitors the water level at the main shipping gate. Only six hours remain until the Norwegian Joy's planned passage. The water on the left side is now deep enough. On the right side, seaward, the water is ebbing. We currently have a water level difference of four and a half meters, and we will start slowly reducing that difference in the foreseeable future. The tide is slowly coming in from the sea and will very slowly start letting water out from the riverside so the big ship can pass through this opening with an even water level. The even water level on both sides of the barrier is vital. To prevent the Norwegian Joy from sliding through the barrier, out of control. Whether the flow of water from the tide will raise the level on the seaward side that much is out of Backer and his team's control. Andreas, how far are we now? When can we start letting water out? We can start at about 10 o'clock. How high will the high tide be? A quarter meter under the middle level. Okay, good. That's 25 centimeters fewer than expected. It's going to be tight. Reinhard Backer has to make a decision for himself, his team, and for the $900 million ship. Helmut, we'd like to start with a half meter opening now. With that, he gives the go to attempt the passage. That basically kicks off the critical phase, where we start the water level adjustment procedures and have to keep informing the ship how much longer it will be, one hour, two hours, or whatever, so that they can prepare themselves. The ship has to get moving again. It is resting without any propulsion, and it takes a certain amount of time to get it moving again. The morning sun breaks through the fog. When will the ocean giant go through the lock? On board, Torsten Kruis uses the weight to get an idea how much work still needs to be done. But to keep to the tight schedule, the ship now needs to get through the barrier to Emshaven as quickly as possible. We have as few people as possible on board during the Ems transit because we simply want to focus on getting the ship conveyed properly. So, we reduce the number of workers to a minimum. Tomorrow is the big work day. We're expecting another 1,200 workers to come aboard tomorrow, and then things will really be busy here. If the Norwegian Joy doesn't make it through the barrier during the next high tide, the planning will have to be scrapped, and 1,200 workers would get a day off. The two water levels are now only 30 centimeters apart. Now Reinhard Backer has to pick the right moment to have the lock gates opened entirely. Andreas, we'll raise the lift gates now. 11.55. Exactly, the main shipping gate in five minutes. No, it can run at the same time. You wanted much less than 30. It is. One centimeter is obvious? Yes. Okay then. Okay, open the main shipping gate, please. Main shipping gate open a 60-meter wide lane for the Norwegian Joy. But the time window is short. The ebb is starting and the water level is dropping again. The ship has to get through as quickly as possible. Hi, Wilfried, we've opened it, you can move out. Um. 
The Norwegian Joy needs all the propulsion power it has now. Its five diesel engines have an output of over 100,000 horsepower, a massive amount of thrust. The tugs try to pilot the ship through the shipping channel. of space to the left and right. That is normally more than enough. But due to the strong current, the ocean giant has to move quickly. That is risky. Navigation errors can hardly be corrected. And the faster the ship is moving, the deeper it rests in the water. Calculations prove correct. The Norwegian Joy appears as light as a feather as it glides through the barrier. Now we can relax and really enjoy watching the passage because it's finally out. It's a wrap. The Norwegian Joy has floated to freedom. It turns around in the harbor basin at Emden. And then, for the first time, it's full speed ahead. Destination, the Dutch port of Imshaven. Captain Wolfgang Tors sums up the passage. I would say it went nearly perfectly, in the sense that it really can't go much better. Sure, you can always have better tide conditions, but the wind conditions were optimal, and the technical reliability was good. The team was perfectly organized, so I am very, very happy. The Norwegian Joy managed the transit from Papenburg to the North Sea with flying colors. Her first true test. The first 50 kilometers were the hardest. Millions of nautical miles lie ahead of her. She is set to debut in China in summer 2017. Hopefully, from now on, she will always have water to spare under her keel. The biggest. The heaviest. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's stuck on the track. The most. And the most expensive goods on Earth. Everything people can move. On land. On water. And in the air. Record-breaking, stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. A giant of the skies, the Antonov AN124 100M150. Worldwide the biggest production cargo aircraft of all time. 35 years old and still highly sought after in the transport sector. No aircraft can transport more goods. At the height of the Cold War, an important means of national transport and prestige object for the Soviet Union. Now, it is in use all over the world and is the queen of international air transport. Today, it is bringing a 61-ton generator 11,000 kilometers from England to South Korea. Normally a piece of cake, but every job has its quirks. 
tell him not to go up there with the crowbar. What's he doing? The crew is under time pressure, and they don't suspect that inadequate equipment and unprepared workers await them at their destination. The transport could very well end in disaster. We lifted off the, the rail track, and it will suddenly collide. And then we have a huge problem, of course. A suicide mission of sorts. Will the mega transport survive the ordeal? East Midlands Airport, 70 kilometers north of Birmingham. The Antonov AN-124 is due to land here at the cargo terminal in a few minutes. This man is responsible for getting the mega transport off to a smooth start, logistics manager Tom Blakeman. His job is to make sure everything stays on schedule. Tom Blakeman. Hello, Paul. Very well, very well. Just waiting for your aircraft. Yeah, that's him. A 73-meter wingspan. Even at a distance, it looks like a giant. Without cargo, the Antonov already weighs 175 tons. Of the 56 Antonovs built, only 37 are still in use today. No matter what the airport, all over the world, the Antonov always causes a sensation. The East Midlands cargo terminal is no exception. Although the Antonov lands here often, it is always a special event for Tom Blakeman. The, the thing about this aircraft is that even though we handle about 40 a year, that you learn something new about it every time it comes in. And it's just a fascinating aircraft. It's totally unique. The type is totally unique. There's nothing like it in the West. Uh, it, it really is, a, it, it created its own market. The Antonov AN-124 is a great success for the engineers of the former Soviet Union in 1982. Nearly 70 meters long and more than 21 meters high, its dimensions dwarf all other aircrafts. Up to 25 cars could park on just one wing. But the aircraft's true strength is hidden in its belly. The cargo hold is 1,040 cubic meters. A total of 150 tons of additional weight can be stowed here. Behind the wings on the upper deck, a sleeping and lounge area with space for 88 people. The cargo hold is not pressurized, thus it should not be entered during the flight. And so the pilots sleep in a cabin right behind the cockpit. Logistics manager Tom Blakeman goes looking for the Antonov's flight manager. There is no time to lose, for every loading job is tightly scheduled. The special thing about the cargo hold is its height. The AN-124 can take freight measuring up to 4.4 meters, such as the most powerful tractor in the world. No other production aircraft can do that. A movable five meter metal ladder leads to the cockpit. It is full of ancient Soviet technology. Thus, instead of two pilots, a six-person team is required to control the Antonov. The mega transporter is already 35 years old, but is no less fascinating on account of its age. It, it's, it's always an awesome sight as it's taxiing towards you, yeah? Uh, and I think that's really the awe of it before you you enter the, the cargo compartment. But once you enter this place, it's very much like a warehouse, a cathedral even. All reverence aside, the logistics manager must make sure that the Antonov stays on schedule. The customer is paying about 300,000 euros for the charter flight. And every minute of delay costs more. Open the hatch.
everyone obeys his commands. Sergei Bulachenko, the 62-year-old load manager, is in charge of the cargo hold. Loading this aircraft is an art, and he is a master of it like no other, as he has spent one-third of his life with the Antonov. I worked on this airplane as an engineer for another company before Antonov Airlines hired me. I kept working with the AN-124, so I've been working for more than 20 years with the same aircraft. First, the team unloads the airplane's internal track system. It will be used later to get the cargo into the Antonov's interior. The load manager leads a team of 10 experts, including flight engineers, technicians and transport workers. In the meantime, the cargo arrives in the security area of the central English airport. The steam generator enthroned on the truck weighs 61 tons. Its value about 5 million euros. If everything goes well, in three days it will already be in use 11,000 kilometers away in Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Besides the generator, six other components must go into the cargo hold. The load's total weight is 75 tons, the equivalent of six tractor trailers, a true mega transport. But before the mega cargo can be loaded, it must go through a few security checks. The generator must be scanned for possible explosives, the same as every piece of tourist luggage. It just takes a bit longer, up to six hours. But Jamie Parker remains cool. He works for the logistics company at East Midlands Airport and has allowed for all eventualities. We factor in things that may delay the flight. So we have that little bit of a window in case we have any knock-on delays, loading delays, which with aviation always happens. The explosive screening starts one hour late. Not good. The security officer is having a problem with the scanner. But the crew must be able to start loading the generator on time in order to avoid extra costs. Meanwhile, the Antonov's technician crew is still unloading the track system at the cargo terminal. Once the tracks are set up as two rails in front of the airplane, cable winches haul the cargo on board on a loading sled. The Antonov's loading system is unique, for all other cargo planes need additional lifting systems to help transport freight inside through the nose. To load the 61-ton generator onto the airplane, we have to lower the front, as it were. Then we set up the tracks, place the cargo on them, and finally haul it into the airplane. The airplane's entire nose can be opened upwards using a hydraulic apparatus. In the process, the lifting mechanism raises a total of 1.4 tons. It takes three minutes for both nose landing gears to slide forward. The cargo hold slopes down 3.5 degrees, thus allowing itself to be loaded from the ground. Truly exceptional. The first step in loading is to position the ramp. Ramp and tracks must be exactly parallel to the ground in a 90 degree angle. Otherwise, the generator could fall over during loading and, in the worst case, even damage the airplane. Under the load manager's watchful eyes, the men begin lowering the 10-ton ramp. As soon as it is in the proper position, supports will be placed underneath it. From now on, the Antonov must be handled with the utmost finesse. Instead of high technology, Sergei Bulachenko relies on traditional tools. Okay. 
It's very important to get the ramp at the proper angle, so we use a level. Bulachenko must make sure that the track system is exactly parallel. Any mistakes would only come to light later and could have catastrophic consequences. Back to the cargo. The explosive screening is complete. The crew has made up some time, but it is still 30 minutes behind schedule. The generator is given a seal and wrapped up again. Now it's time for the general security check. Has to go through the, through the checkpoint, so the driver has to be secured, the cab has to be checked to make sure that's secure. Uh, the documentation to make sure that it's made known has to be checked before it goes through to uh, the air side. This last check stands between the cargo and the Antonov. The clock is ticking. Each delay threatens to push back the scheduled departure time. The suspense mounts. At the cargo terminal, the Antonov's team is still busy with the exact position of the nose ramp. Load manager Sergei Bulachenko takes a final measurement. It's good. Success. The crew's next task is to set up the airplane's internal track system. As opposed to all other large cargo planes, the Antonov does not technically require any extra lifting trucks or hoisting platforms. The kneeling giant has everything it needs on board. This is another unique feature and an unbeatable advantage. A special crane must be used, only to lift the generator onto the tracks. Scheduled departure is in four hours. Loading can take up to six hours. If the generator doesn't show up soon, time will get tight. Logistics manager Tom Blakeman is still optimistic. As long as we have everything complete for 1,800 local when the crew turn up, the flight deck uh, will be on schedule. It might be a bit, little bit close to the line, but we'll be, we'll be on schedule. Finally, the long-awaited phone call comes. The generator has cleared the final security check. That's fine, Paul. That's fine, yeah. Yeah, keep bringing forward. A lifting beam hoists the generator onto the tracks. In total, more than 30 people are working on the loading. Methodically, calmly, professionally. After all, the generator is worth 5 million euros. So everything from now until it's in position on the noseless uh, system will happen very slowly and deliberately. Raise the load, set it down, done. Sounds easy. But this type of loading is a pioneering invention in the history of aviation. At the end of the 1970s, Soviet engineers developed the Antonov AN-124 as an army transport plane. The innovation, the flat ramp at the nose lets armored track vehicles drive directly into the cargo hold from the ground. Upon its first flight in 1982, the Antonov was the biggest airplane in the world, with a maximum takeoff weight of over 400 tons. But the AN-124's career only really took off with the end of the Cold War. After being converted to a civil cargo plane, it has been operated by Antonov Airlines in Kiev. The airline's fleet consists of seven planes of the type AN-124. They transport very heavy loads for international customers around the globe. To make sure the planes remain flightworthy, they are brought here for maintenance every two years at the most. This man is proud to be one of the head designers at Antonov Airlines, Alexander Loss. 
for the Antonov can do a few things that no other cargo plane can. The multi-strut landing gear, which has several intentions, to evenly distribute the loads to the, uh, to the fuselage and to the airframe, to reduce the specific weight and pressure on the airfield if, in case of if it is con concrete, snow, if we speak about some practical things for the decades to come, this is the answer in the heavy world transportation. A Soviet masterpiece, a stroke of genius with a history and future potential. The history begins in 1947 with the first flight of the Antonov II. The arms race engaged in by the Cold War superpowers accelerated technical development enormously. It is the most interesting part of Antonov history because this is the beginning, the origin of really of Antonov Design Bureau. The number of airplanes produced already more than 16,000, so, so this is the record keeper in the world of, in, in terms of mass produced airplane. Asphalt, gravel or ice. The very first Antonovs could already land on any surface. In this respect, they are still unique around the world. But just like with human beings, the older they get, the more intense their maintenance. This AN-124 has been flying for 23 years and is supposed to fly for another 23. To make this happen, the experts in Kiev take it apart completely every two years. This time, they find 800 defects. They have two months to repair the cargo plane. In this period of time, 80 technicians work on the project, three shifts a day if necessary around-the-clock maintenance. Today, the four engines are being inspected. Each one has a thrust of 23 tons. Senior engineer Alexei Pervishko oversees and coordinates the work. Look at the outlet. The blocking valve on the tube has to be closed. Everything on the crossbeam has to be right. Right away. Then put the doors back on. Pervishko has been working at Antonov Airlines for 18 years, and he knows the AN-124's quirks. The undercarriage must also be given a general overhaul today. Something to be changed here? Is there also a problem here? On the right strut or the left? They've taken the part off and will wash and sterilize it. If they have questions, they'll let me know. One of the axles is slightly bent and probably has to be replaced. A puzzle with many tiny pieces. Antonov is not a company, but a family. And the airplanes are not products, but the children. Everyone here says so. And everyone here lives by this motto, including Alexei. The work is interesting and I like it. I started as a technician and for nine years now I've been head flight engineer for this airplane. I especially like that you can touch each piece with your own hands. The plane doesn't look good when it's taken apart. But then the technicians reassemble it and it transforms into a beautiful bird, a dream. Now it's time for the wings. With a surface area of almost 630 square meters, they are as big as one and a half sports centers. Its maintenance will require a lot of time and money, as an external laboratory tested some small parts and found considerable defects. Alexei has checked the results. Now, he tells his workers what to do. There are holes right in this area. That's not allowed. The documents show that these areas were checked and that these parts must be replaced. When this Antonov AN-124 was built, digital technology was still a foreign concept. That makes maintenance a mammoth task. 
back at East Midlands Airport in Great Britain. The Antonov is waiting for today's cargo. It is supposed to transport a 61-ton generator 11,000 kilometers to South Korea. But first, the team has to load it safely. A special crane hoists the multi-ton cargo from the low bed trailer onto a special loading sled. Load manager Sergei Bulachenko watches the generator's progress like a hawk. Load it straight. Once it's down, that's it. Precision work with a crane. The team must continually reposition the generator. Okay. No, a little more. It has to be parallel, okay? Only the load manager can give the order to set it down. The smallest mistake and the generator will tip over. Finished. The metal block has survived the move unscathed. Sergei Bulachenko is relieved. The cargo will now be positioned, tied down and secured. Then we'll start loading the plane. Time to get working. The clock is ticking. Only four hours remain until the scheduled departure. Only those directly involved in the work may be up close during loading. And for good reason. Cables under tension are always uh, dangerous things because if they snap, there's a whiplash effect and it'll just chop you in half. So any time a cable's under tension, that's, that's a sensitive issue. Yeah. To keep the generator from falling backwards in case the cables break, the team continually reattaches the securing chains. Centimeter by centimeter, the Colossus slides into the plane's belly. After about an hour, it has disappeared inside the mega transporter. Special mounts in the floor make sure the cargo does not move during the flight. But the load manager, Sergei Bulachenko, is not yet satisfied. Okay, let's take these two anchorings and pull them out from the other side to make more room for the crates. <laughs> And we have to move the generator another half meter forward, just like that. Now let's remove these two platforms if we can. The final position is precisely calculated. In the so-called center wing box, the most stable part of the airplane. Only here does the generator not endanger the mega freighter's balance. If the airplane's center of gravity shifts, in the worst case, it could crash. Here, every inch makes the difference between success and failure. Finally, the load manager gives the OK to secure the generator. The cargo must be right on the calculated spot to keep the plane balanced. That is essential to safety. The team fastidiously secures the generator on the perfect spot. Using the internal cargo crane, the crew then hoists the rest of the crates on board. The master of the cargo hold now looks satisfied. 
Loading is complete. We were even a half hour ahead of schedule. The team did a great job, the customer did a great job, and now we're all satisfied. During loading, Bulachenko's team made up for an hour's delay. The cargo, weighing 75 tons in total, has been stowed securely in the Antonov's belly. For logistics manager Tom Blakeman, the job is done. Everyone's a challenge. Uh, I think the, the favourite is the one you're working on at the time. Uh, but everyone uh, has its own challenges. So they're all, they're all favourites. The Antonov's crew stows the track system in the cargo hold. Using hydraulics, the giant plane is returned to its normal shape, considerably heavier than a few hours earlier. But will the mega transporter bring the cargo to its destination safely? Shortly before takeoff, now only the cockpit crew is missing. And they take care of the safety check. An external inspection is compulsory for the 35-year-old AN-124. The pilots check the airplane for dripping hoses and cracks in the skin. Yevkin Bashinsky is being trained as a pilot on the Antonov. In the cockpit, the 32-year-old Ukrainian first checks the emergency exit. These doors here open down. And down here we have an escape tube. And what we have here is a rope. So, if there is an emergency situation, we can escape the aircraft safely by using this rope. And this emergency exit. If there is a problem, the pilots reach safety using a slide. There are also parachutes on board. Every instrument in this cockpit is operated and controlled by human hand. To fly the giant, two navigators and flight engineers sit behind the pilots. The operating functions are similar to control in this aircraft than any other aircraft. I cannot say that it's harder to fly this aircraft or easier. But not each airport can provide enough clearance for us. The Antonov is supposed to take off in 45 minutes. First, Sergei, the pilot, must inspect the engines. Here too, everything is analog, not digital. Four turbofan engines power the AN-124. Their combined thrust power is equal to 600 BMW 7 Series. The massive undercarriage is also a technological masterpiece. The air pressure in the 24 tires can be lowered by 30% while in flight. Thus, the Antonov can take off from cement and land on sand or hard-packed snow. Incredible. In the back of the plane, a shaky ladder leads to the upper deck. This is where the cargo hold team lives and works when on assignment. Instead of stewardesses, the men must rely on self-service. There is no luxury to be found. So that the team can rest, most of the seat rows have been converted to sleeping berths. Come up. During the flight, the crew is not able to enter the cargo hold underneath. Mistakes, such as loose anchoring, would only come to light after landing. Airtight hatch separates the men from the cargo hold. From now on, they can only hope that all the chains hold. 
It's time. The Colossus taxis onto the runway. To lift its 250 tons into the air, the Antonov must reach a starting speed of at least 290 kilometers per hour. The pilots give full thrust. The journey to Seoul is nearly 11,000 kilometers long. Since the Antonov cannot refuel in mid-air, it must stop along the way to fill up. In Burgas, in Bulgaria, in Turkmenbashi, Turkmenistan, and in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. The heavy weight has its price. It takes two days for the cargo to reach its final destination, Seoul in South Korea. During the flight, only the load manager can communicate with the pilots in an emergency. At an altitude of 10,000 meters, there is little for the cargo hold crew to do. Three and a half hours later, the mega transporter prepares for its first approach. The crew affectionately calls the massive cargo plane Hotel Antonov. They spend three months at a time away from home. But with a little luck, they can get very close to their loved ones while in flight. When we fly to Europe, then we almost always fly over my dacha. My wife is retired, and we have a grandson already. And they watch us with pride when we fly by very low. In Bulgaria, the mega transporter has to refuel for the first time. 60,000 liters of aviation gasoline. With this amount of fuel, a car could drive around the world 23 times. The loaded Antonov can make it about 4,000 kilometers. At the same time, load manager Sergei Bulachenko checks on the valuable cargo in the giant's belly. It's absolutely necessary to check the weight and status of the cargo every time we land. We have to make sure everything is stowed properly and then we record everything in a log. The cargo plane itself must also be thoroughly checked after every landing. The technicians make small repairs right at the gate. But after 4,000 flight hours, a general overhaul is necessary. That means about every two years, the Antonov planes must be thoroughly inspected. In this way, each plane can be used around the clock for up to 45 years. Back in the maintenance hangar in Kiev, this Antonov AN-124 is scheduled to make its next flight in two months. But before then, the technicians must fix 800 defects. Time is slipping away. Alexei Pervishko is one of the head engineers at the hangar. He monitors and coordinates all the work on the aging aircraft. One of the weak spots on which Alexei's crew is working today is the cockpit. The technical equipment must continuously keep pace with the modernized control systems used at airports. We have a problem. Some of the instruments were dismantled and their parts are in the lab for maintenance or were even sent back to the manufacturer. Thus, some parts of the equipment being checked now are not complete. One person who might know the plane better than Alexei is Sergei Komarov. The 59-year-old has worked here for 40 years even met the great designer Oleg Antonov personally. There is probably no screw, no rivet on this airplane that Sergei does not know. Even up here on the wing, 20 meters off the ground. I'm checking the fuel tank system for cracks and leaks. In principle, this work is not difficult for a qualified specialist. It's what we're trained for. With good training, the only thing you've got to do is pay attention. It's not complicated. Only it's high off the ground, and it's a lot of work. 
the work plan is tightly scheduled. Step by step, the technicians eliminate all the defects and check off each service item. The next thing for Sergei Komarov to check is the massive undercarriage's hydraulics. Look where the fluid is pumped to. If the pump malfunctions and does not pump out the fluid, landing becomes a real problem. The maintenance work seems endless. But Sergei Komarov tells us, with no little pride, why he has earned his living here for 40 years. Our whole soul is in there. The soul of our factory, of our mechanics, designers, the soul of each man. The airplane shows what we Ukrainians can accomplish. And I've never yet seen a comparable aircraft, one that can transport such unusual bulky cargo. When he has time, Viktor Goncharov comes to the hangar to see how the work is going. He is one of the few Antonov test pilots, and he commands absolute respect. Viktor, according to the stories told here, has the windows of a plane darkened so that he can take off and land blind, relying entirely on the instruments. In addition to the standard testing of newly installed equipment, such extraordinary maneuvers are among the Antonov test pilot's chief tasks. They are specially trained to simulate emergency situations in the air, like the loss of an engine. For him, an Antonov is a fascinating challenge in comparison to a modern plane. Of course, this airplane has its peculiarities. Like every airplane. Above all, you have to be aware of the incredible weight spectrum. Sometimes you're flying a very light plane. Other times, a very heavy one. You fly it very differently depending on the weight. In only two months, the airplane is scheduled to leave the hangar in Kiev. It will then resume flying heavy transports around the entire globe. Change of scene. The mega transporter's inspection at the Borges airport is complete. The six-man cockpit team prepares for takeoff. There are no computers. The crew operates every instrument by hand. The Antonov needs 2.7 kilometers to reach its takeoff speed. The runways are often only three kilometers long. Little leeway for the pilots. On its way from Bulgaria to Seoul, the Antonov stops in Turkmenistan and then in Kyrgyzstan located 1,800 kilometers away. After a seven-hour layover, it takes off for its final destination. The approach to South Korea's capital. In 48 hours, the generator is slated to supply energy in a nearby location at its new operation site, the island of Techu. Promptly at 11 a.m., the mega transporter taxis to the cargo terminal. The men do not yet know what difficulties await them. The Antonov's gigantic proportions are also a real eye-catcher in tech-savvy Korea. The customer has sent a veritable reception committee to the airport, but the crew cannot let itself be distracted by the onlookers. Everything must be perfect again when setting up the track system. Only when the rails are in their exact position can the crew safely unload the generator. They have four hours. Watch the cables we're laying the brackets under. 
Using two winches, the team slowly slides the 61-ton generator out of the cargo hold. But this time, there is a problem. The loading sled keeps getting skewed on the rails. Load manager Sergei Bulachenko is angry. Tell him not to go up there with the crowbar. What's he doing? The boss has to fix his team's mistake with his own hands. He continually checks the generator's position. Now, everything seems fine. After two hours, the job is done. But now, a forced break. They must wait for the special crane, which will hoist the generator from the tracks. After three additional hours, it is finally allowed onto the tarmac. Apparently, the South Korean airport doesn't have enough experience with such heavy cargo. After all, it's not every day that an Antonov lands here. The crane operator also seems overwhelmed. He comes dangerously close to the giant cargo plane's nose. The Antonov's crew is alarmed. If something happened to the plane or its crew now, right before the finish line, it would be a catastrophe. Ben Mormon is also rather worried. The engineer works for the company that makes the generator and is acting as a consultant for the customer. Above all, the thin lifting bars are a cause for concern. No one can say with certainty if they will be able to bear the weight of the generator. What possibly can go wrong is that the items appear too weak and when we connect it's going to be a trial and error situation, which is not desirable. We lift it off the, the rail track and it will suddenly collide. And then we have a huge problem, of course. We damage the aircraft, the cargo and also the crane materials. And then we have a huge, huge problem. And then another logistics error with disastrous consequences. According to the manufacturer, the crane's cables can bear a maximum weight of 48 tons but the generator weighs 61 tons. This doesn't add up. The unloading seems to have been born under a bad sign. The operation is suspended. A bitter pill for the Antonov's crew. At this point, no one knows if they'll be able to finish the job today. Flight manager Yuri Mayevsky exercises patience. If we stop now, we have to load this cargo back, secure it in the aircraft, and tomorrow we'll start all procedure. The longest unloading operation the crew has ever experienced lasted 24 hours. Here in Korea, seven hours have already gone by. But a phone call gives the customer's consultant some hope. We have received good news. Yeah, finally. After uh, very uh, much phone calls, they have found uh, new material. And also, we have made a change in plans. We're not going to use the lifting bars, which are a little bit weak in my eyes. And everybody here agrees. We're now heading for a new approach. And this will result in a much uh, better way to lift it, a much safer. The new cables will be attached directly to the generator. Three hours later, the men finally resume unloading the cargo. But after so many mistakes, the Antonov's load manager remains skeptical. Wait. Wait. Don't go there yet. Tension is in the air and on the cables. Will they bear the generator's weight? A few minutes later, the crew can finally breathe a sigh of relief. The cables hold, and without further ado, the crane moves the cargo onto the low bed trailer standing by. 
five hours late, but at least the job's done now. A nerve-wracking day comes to a close. Ben Mormon, the consultant, is exhausted, but visibly relieved. It was a little bit of a discussion with a few people, but finally everybody was on the same page and we did a good job uh, to get a safe job done. Everybody wants always a safe operation. And that's what we achieved, so I'm very lucky. The mega transporter has successfully completed its mission. The generator survived the transport from England to Korea unscathed and is now on its way to its operation site. Everything went well. The flight was flawless. My team worked professionally and I had fun. I've spent my whole life with the Antonov. There is barely a country on earth the Antonov's crew has not yet seen. The men will relax in Seoul for two days. Then they will get ready again. For a new mega transport awaits the gigantic airplane. The biggest. The heaviest. Fuck. Ah, oh, it's stuck on the track. The most. And the most expensive goods on Earth. Everything people can move. On land. On water. And in the air. Record-breaking, stunning, global. They are Mega Transports. It is the most stunning relocation project in the world. A whole village in northern Sweden needs a new home. Without it, Malmbergert would simply get swallowed up by the earth. A mega transport and an incredible rescue mission. Be careful, I have no good grip now. A journey that takes the houses and the workers to their limits. With moving a house in steep hills through the village, that's pretty tight and difficult to manage. A mega transport that requires mega nerves. Of course, when the house is bigger, you have to have more focus and a little bit more nerves, of course. And must overcome mega obstacles. Malmberget in Sweden, in Lapland to be more precise, 70 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. It has 3,200 inhabitants and faces a challenge. The historic village is literally sinking and must be relocated. Malmberget is where Swedish steel comes from. One of the biggest iron ore mines on Earth is located 1,250 meters below the village. Each year, 5 million tons of iron ore and products are extracted. But the more rock the miners cut and carry away, the more the ground sinks. It looks like the surface of the moon. The crater landscape separates Malmberget into western and eastern sections. Soon, there will be no ground here at all. The mine giveth and the mine taketh away. But Malmberget must continue to exist. The village is too important in Sweden's history. Its historic house is too valuable and precious. Thus, the state-run mining company attempts the unheard of, the mega transport of an entire village. Work is already in full swing on the uppermost street called Ersgötterving. All the houses here must make it to their new location intact. This man prepares every single house for transport. A Swede in a cowboy hat, Tommy Newland, 
along with his three-man team. He has been a house mover for 15 years and has even relocated entire train stations. But never a house like this. This building in Malmberget is the greatest challenge of Tommy Newland's life. The villa at 2A Hoyersbacher is Malmberget's pride and joy. It is the tallest and most beautiful house far and wide, and the most difficult to transport. It weighs as much as 100 SUVs. The villa is about 100 years old, 14 meters wide, 14 meters tall, and 14 meters long, in the shape of a T with three chimneys. Its total weight, 210 tons. Tommy Newland's first job, removing the earth around the villa. That's how it always starts. The relocation of Mount Birgit is a long-term project with several stages. 18 buildings are on the agenda for this year, 11 houses and seven sheds. The peculiar thing about this villa, Tommy must number every individual stone. We're gonna save the granite, the stone, the foundation gonna be saved for a new spot. So this is really, we have to be really careful with them. We cannot smash them and we have to take them down really carefully and how you take down big granite stones carefully, it's a mystery, but are you gonna do it? And we're going to save them and put them up on a new site. And this is how the mystery is solved. Tommy's team drills holes in the mortar between the stones in order to take them out. Hopefully, the team will manage to reconstruct the foundation exactly at the new location. But there's one small problem. I forgot to document the picture. The, the wall numbers. To remember exactly, there is numbers, but you don't know where to start. If number one is there or there or... The villa is the only house in Malmberget that stands on a granite foundation. Around 200 chunks. The team must remove each one using drills and crowbars. Working by hand is gentler, but it requires greater effort. And this is only the beginning. The villa will demand much more of the men. All the machine shovels were built by Tommy Newland himself. Special house moving equipment simply does not exist. It takes about half an hour to break through the first wall, but that was just the prelude. Before the actual transport can begin, the team must complete three tasks. The first, making holes in the foundation. The holes are necessary for the most important step, namely the second task, placing eight steel girders under the villa so that it can travel stably. Without them, the heavy chimneys in particular would likely break. Task number three, using hydraulics to lift the whole villa so that the transporter can drive underneath and take it away. It all depends on the chimneys. With them, the whole transport literally stands or falls. The chimney is like a stone column in the center of the house and uh, it's the heaviest part of the house. We need to get a good uh, connection with the beam so we really, really are sure that it's uh, come with us when we're lifting the house. Otherwise we have a big mess inside with cracks around the chimneys and uh, a lot of issues later. The difficulty, the team must drill into the chimney in order to place the steel girder underneath that supports it but the team may drill away only one side. That is only half of the chimney. Otherwise, it would collapse. Thus, the steel girder may only go under one half of the chimney. The men repeatedly make sure that they are not removing too much. 
Then they discover an iron beam in the ceiling, an old fireplace or part of the chimney. A crucial question. The house movers have to know what it is, because if they don't get the chimney along with the iron beam, the whole villa could collapse before it has moved one centimeter. You can see this is the chimney. Yeah. And we took that part down. We find the beam under, so we was going up and double check it, and there is no fireplace. It's only the, the shape of the chimney, like the, the same shape you see down there. So that's good for us. I uh, just I just don't remember exactly because I'm we've been moving 32 houses up here and we've been checking everybody and sometimes you forget if it's a fireplace or not. In addition to the chimneys, the men must deal with another big problem area. Oh, you make the marks also. No? Yeah. This connection between the, the stone and the wood is the most, most fragile. So we have to be really careful so we don't crack this or getting too much movement between them. When they lift the villa later, it must remain absolutely level. Otherwise, terrible cracks will immediately appear in every wall. In the attic, it becomes clear why this villa makes the house movers work much more difficult than all the other houses. Two chimneys run together up here. That means one of the three chimneys is in reality a double chimney. Tommy Newland must make very sure that he actually secures all the chimneys under the house. Three chimneys are visible on the roof, but there are actually four. That means more work, greater caution, and more time required. It makes it a little bit complicated because the other house has only two chimneys in the center line of the house. This house has four chimneys spread out all around the house, so this is a much more complicated and um, it needs more, much more time to make sure you have the, uh, all the chimneys under the beams. This villa has stood in this cozy settlement on the hillside for 98 years. Now all the houses here must go. In a few months, the mega transport must be complete. The procedure is similar for all the houses. A team of specialists drives up with a trailer about 30 meters long, which they must move under the house. The team must maneuver the trailer onto a precise spot. Then, the specialists use hydraulics to lift the trailer bed. When the building rests precisely on the calculated spot, the epic journey can begin. It sounds like a routine job, And, in fact, house moving is nothing new in Malmberget. The relocation of the church in 1974 marked the beginning of a larger resettlement program. In quick succession, it was followed by the school, the movie theater, and stores, and also large parts of the village center. By 2032, 2,000 residential units must be relocated. 250,000 square meters of land will be cleared that means almost the entire village will disappear. And be resurrected here, in the neighboring town of Koskoskuye, seven kilometers away. Despite the proximity to the mine, Malmberger's houses can remain here, for the mine extends in the opposite direction. Koskoskuye will grow tremendously. The old town center is now at the back, in front is a newly created space for the houses from Malmberget, for the ones that came last October, and for all those still to come. Like the old villa at 2A Hoyersbacher. Preparing this jewel for the move is hard work. House mover Tommy Newland and his team are still working on task number two, placing the steel girders. No mistakes may be made now with the chimneys. This is the marks of the uh, actual chimney, and this is the stone. So if you take this stone out, if you take this stone out, so this is the only piece that holds the chimney up. So that's why we have to cut it here, so we get the 50% free and 50% steel on the foundation. 
because the, this is the this is the chimney now. So if you take this stone out, we get a big problem. Tommy Newland's tool, a diamond saw. This uh, chain is not a cutting chain; it's a grinding chain. So it's not uh, it's not like a chainsaw when it you can stuck and you get and get it uh, flying into your face because this is not cutting the actually not the cutting; it's uh, grinding down the stones. It's actually just heavy and a lot of water, so <laughs> it's only good when you just finish the cut. But otherwise, it's really shitty. By that, he means incredibly strenuous. 250 liters of water are heavy. What is more, there is no possibility of improving the job or getting a second chance. If Tommy saws too much away, in the worst case, the chimney can fall through. If he saws too little away, then later he won't be able to secure the chimney optimally with a steel girder. And that could have catastrophic consequences. Ultimately, Tommy Newland must improvise. I changed you for a rock! Eleven and a half horsepower against granite. The battle lasts ten minutes, then it's over. Always hard. This is a granite and you, see, you know, it's a, a lot of a quartz. You see the white stone in it. It's one of the hardest um, stones in the world. So it's, it's really hard with, even with the diamond chainsaw. Tommy takes a short break to catch his breath. His colleague, Michael, finishes the rest. That's why the cameraman should not stand there. <laughs> yeah, look at the nice cut. We won't know whether he is sawed properly until the steel girder arrives. The next day, the team builds wooden towers for the girders to lie on. Their crossbeam construction makes them very stable and they provide enough space for the cylinders that will lift the villa. Now the moment has come for which the team has worked for days the most dangerous part of the preparations. You have a guy there uh, uh, directing me. Uh, whatever he say, I, will, I must follow his order because he see what's happening under the house. And uh, this is the, 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 the moment with the most risk. If there are any risk in this job, it's now. The goal, eight steel girders must go under the villa and both the house and the team must remain intact. One girder weighs two and a half thousand kilograms. If it falls, it would be more than enough to kill a worker or to destroy the house. Michael, we have to turn it this way because I cannot turn it in front of me, it's too long now. There is a lot of pressure on the team. Each beam has to be perfect. Only when all the load-bearing walls and chimneys are faultlessly supported can the house be moved. And it is not only the house they must pay attention to. Be careful, Michael. This is clearly no routine job. Suddenly, the steel girder gets caught. Fuck. Ah, it's stuck on the track. Wait. 
Everything goes wrong today. Now, there's only one thing they can do. Push the steel girder further until the end rests on the first wooden tower. And then, the men on the other side of the villa must somehow lift it onto the second wooden tower. The girder must lie on it perfectly. It cannot fall in the few minutes during which the men drive to the back side. And there are other dangers too. Be careful, I have no good grip now. Like I said, be careful. I have no good grip. All's well that ends well. The first steel girder is in. Seven more to go. They are 14 meters long, a perfect fit under the 14 meter wide house. If the girders jut out too far on the sides, they will impede the transport later. While working with the steel girders, only one member of the team is allowed to get this close to them, Tommy's colleague, Michael. They have been working together for five years and a firm trust has developed between them. Michael gets ominously close to the girders. Trust, professionalism and blind understanding pay off. Every beam is in its place. Now the men must synchronize the girders. That means making sure they are all exactly horizontal and at exactly the same height. Otherwise the villa would ultimately break apart. On the fourth day, all eight steel girders are bearing their weight. Task number two is finally complete. A big part of the job uh, is done with the digging and putting the beam and secure the chimneys. So it feels really good because we have come a long way on this uh, lifting pro project. So this feels really nice now because this is the big step on the journey. Before the villa can begin its journey, one man wants to say goodbye. Jens Andersen, who lived in the house for eight years. <laughs> it's amazing. He has never seen the villa like this before. He and the other inhabitants moved out three months ago to make way for the villa's mega transport. Feels empty. <laughs> Jens really loved this view in particular. And yet, he is happy that at least the villa will be spared. We had good times in, in this, this apartment and um, like watching over the time right, town right now, it's a um, special feeling because the new place we have, it's not, we don't have any views like this. I think moving the houses is a good thing uh, because it's an old house, it has a lot of history. So um, I'm excited to see the new place and Someday I can show my kids where I was staying like for eight years or something. Um, so I think it's a good, good thing to take care of all the houses, not, not tear them apart. Malmberget will not disappear entirely, as long as its houses attest to its former greatness and significance. My grandparents told me that Malmberget were the place where everybody wanted to live at. Normally it was a lot of people over here and um, you see there were like always traffic on the roads and stuff like that and um, maybe in the 90s in the beginning of 20, 2000 it was it was feeling like um, it's getting smaller and smaller because the mine were so close to the town. It feels nowadays like more like a ghost town. The big villa will also be gone soon. Today, after nearly 100 years, it will leave its foundation so that the trailer can drive underneath and carry it on its back. It sounds easy, and Tommy says he only needs a few cylinders for it. But of course, it's not that easy. This is a normal standard 
uh, lifting cylinder. It's a high pressure cylinder. It can stand uh, 700 bars. It lifts 30 ton when you put 700 bars pressure on it. And the pump is an electric powered uh, hydraulic pump with uh, some control valves and a really nice drawing how we're gonna put the <laughs> how we're gonna put the hoses. Just some <laughs> something for the guys to look at. It's not special, but n makes no sense for a normal person. But for us, it's kind of how it's gonna be. 16 cylinders, all operated in sync with one another. Each one can lift 30 tons. That means about twice as much power as necessary for the 200 ton house. The men plan to lift the villa in four or five stages. A few years ago, it worked very differently. In the beginning, when I first year I worked, I just hand pumped all the houses with the, with the hand pump jacks. Yeah, with this small one, then it take maybe two days lifting a house, but you have, that, that doesn't need to go to the gym after. More, more to the chiro chiropractor. <laughs> if everything goes well today, they'll be done in a couple of hours. Hey guys, you ready? Yep. Perfect. The first stopping point is reached at 350 bar, which translates to 10 centimeters. Now the team must continue working quickly. The villa's weight is entirely on the cylinders. If one of them lost pressure, the others would adjust as rapidly as possible. The villa would certainly suffer heavy damage. This is the critical part of the lifting. When it's hanging on the hikers, it's good to finish this. You don't go to break now or take a coffee or something. You finish this. Centimeter by centimeter, the hydraulics lift the villa into the air until it is only balancing on the thin girders. Only now may they all breathe easy. The steel beams are placed correctly. Task number three is complete. Perfect, finished. 1,300 millimeter. All of the difficult tasks of the preparation phase are done. Now the remaining stones must be removed. a road must be created for the trailer. Then, after a week, this very special villa will be ready for the mega transport. It feels great now when the house is uh, prepared and lifted and everything. And I'm really proud of my team that we managed this uh, challenge job with all the chimneys. So it feels really nice. The villa is ready for a new home. With the smaller neighboring houses, things go as follows. After about an hour's drive, the mega transport reaches its destination of Koskoskuyu. Depending on how long the house has been uninhabited before the move, it will be about one year before people can move back in. That's how much time is necessary for renovations. Setting a house back down works similarly to lifting it up. The trailer must drive over the foundation and place the house precisely above the wooden towers. Then the trailer bed is lowered and the building is set down. A whole row of houses is already missing in Malmberget. But today, the moment has come for the biggest and heaviest house, 
for Mann Birgit's pride and joy. After exactly 98 years, today it will leave its birthplace for the first and probably only time. And the route has now also been carefully prepared. For a mega transport means far more than simply bringing a house from point A to point B. Street signs must be removed, streets must be closed, everything in the way of the column's path must go, so that everything will run exactly according to plan today. Now the transport team moves in, experts in the conveyance of truly large objects. This monster on wheels is necessary to bring heavyweights safely to their destination. The experts have already succeeded in moving many smaller houses. But today, they must tackle the biggest and heaviest. This man is in charge of making sure that everything goes smoothly. Project manager, Rick Kaljau. We got a, a 28 meter long trailer here, um, which can be lifted with hydraulics. So we can drive under the house when we're low, and then we can lift the house up. The trailer can be extended piece by piece. It has 18 axles. Each can carry 36 tons and is supported by hydraulic cylinders that allow the trailer bed to be raised and lowered. This is important for loading and unloading, but also during the move. It allows the trailer to stay level even when driving over an uneven or bumpy surface. This is what makes it possible to transport a house without damaging it. The hydraulics are controlled directly on the trailer. So while we do the operation, there will be one operator in here. One will be in the truck, and that one uh, is going to um, use the, the, the sticks to uh, keep the, the, the trailer as level as possible, and he keeps uh, the trailer within the stroke. The trailer's 144 wheels have a special feature that is important when loading and during transport. They can be steered by remote control. This helps the bulky trailer get around narrow curves. Heavy-duty transports are nothing new for them, but the relocation of Mount Birgit is something special, even for Rick. For us, it's, I won't say a daily job, but we do it all the time. But if you drive that house through the village, all people are standing there, they're stopping cars, they're making photographs, that's like, you, you, you can imagine what the impact of moving a house is. Today is the big day. For the residents of Malenbergert, for the transport team, but also for Tommy Newland. Now we'll see whether his team did good work. It feels really nice after all these uh, weeks of working. And now we're going to take the trailer under and make the first test lift. So, but I have to be there under and see what's happening. Is the house mover somewhat nervous? No, not nervous, but excited. Of course. The villa must sit properly on the trailer in order to be transported. So the team must put it exactly in the right position, which is not simply in the middle, Instead, the trailer has to go under the house's center of gravity. This doesn't work at the drop of a hat. The men must drive the trailer in and out again in order to hit the center of gravity. Workers at the front and back help to position the trailer optimally. They can't see each other, so they communicate by walkie-talkie. Uh, 
Then, after 30 minutes, the trailer is finally in the perfect position. It's time to raise the house. The trailer bed can be raised to a maximum height of 155 centimeters. That is the height at which the team will drive the house away from the wooden towers. The trailer bed's lowest height is 90 centimeters. During the move, the team will transport the villa at an average height of 110 centimeters. The trailer must be able to make adjustments for hills and holes. That means the trailer bed must be raised 65 centimeters. Yeah, there are people inside the house to look if everything uh, going smooth right in the house. And we're just doing uh, a step by step. So we're putting 20 bars more and we'll just lift it up, see if nothing's gonna happen then get a little bit more and a little bit more. So that's step by step the procedure of lifting the house. A cumbersome and cautious approach. But it's the only way the men can know that 200 tons are sitting properly on the trailer. Only then can they judge how the house will react during the transport. A procedure full of suspense. So far, the experts have been working on the basis of theoretical calculations. Total weight, mass distribution, center of gravity. If they have miscalculated anywhere, they will notice it immediately. This, is, uh, this part of our operation is the most delicate part because we need to lift the house and we don't know where the exact COG or what the exact weight is. The house was already built, so um, due to changes, uh, old plans, uh, renovations, the, the, um, the COG uh, uh, or the center of gravity will always be an estimation. So it's not a new build fabrication product where we can have point out the COG. Um, so it that's make house moving a lot more difficult. After four hours, it is done. The villa rests on the trailer and not on the wooden towers. The team still has to fasten the steel girders with chains. They are the only means of securing the building. Its own weight takes care of the rest. A big step has been taken, but now a path full of obstacles lies ahead. When you move a house, you probably are in really uh, small villages, tight areas, uh, with a wide load. So we can move like um, stuff that's twice uh, as heavy as the house, but it's probably uh, a little less wide and it's pretty straightforward. With moving a house in steep hills through the village with houses on your left, uh, trees on your right, that, that's pretty tight and difficult to manage. We cannot just go home and wait for the next day. Everything has to be 100% today. The mega transport has a tricky seven kilometer road ahead of it. It must tackle many difficulties. Right at the beginning, the slope of the street as it descends the hill. The street has a gradient of eight to 10%. The road is gravel and is not completely level. Then there are a few curves in Malmberget and finally, three roundabouts lie in wait. The problem, the transport must always be moving, but with a top speed of 10 kilometers per hour and as straight as possible. Any uncontrolled movement like braking must be avoided as it could damage the villa. Centimeter by centimeter, the Colossus starts moving and must immediately turn so that it can go down the hill backwards. But as soon as it gets going, the weather turns bad. It looks like rain. That could put an end to the journey before it has even begun. In order to make the turn properly, the trailer must drive onto these steel plates. The team has laid them on the grass so that the trailer does not sink into the ground. But the plates must be dry. Otherwise, the trailer loses traction. 
Thus, at all costs, it has to be on the plates before it starts raining. A critical situation right at the beginning of the transport. Now, it is all about millimeters, seconds, and above all, strong nerves. The trailer makes it onto the steel plates just in time. But they can't relax yet. For now, the first challenge is at hand, the steep hill. A major problem for the villa's stability. For the first time in almost 100 years, the old wooden house is tilting forward. The hillside is too steep. The cylinder's hydraulics cannot offset the slope enough to keep the villa upright. Will the old villa play along? And then the passage gets very, very narrow, to the right and to the left. Fifteen minutes later, the descent is finished. But there are still many more difficulties. Even on a flat stretch, the building is extremely awkward to transport. This is because of its high center of gravity. The stability with this house is more uh, challenging because it's way shorter than the rest. And um, the COG is, uh, is like just beneath the, the, the upper window. And if you can imagine how higher a COG is, uh, how harder it is to balance. So it's harder to find for the trailer to find its stability. So you can imagine with a pen, if I hold it like this, I won't put any pressure with my fingers. But if this will be twice as long or three times as long, I will need to have more muscle power in my fingers to keep it stable. The truck's 620 horsepower is no longer sufficient. A second is necessary. The second truck is obligatory when the total weight of the transport is over 250 tons. The main job of the second truck, to help with braking. The mega transport continues, but soon, an obstacle will crop up with which no one has reckoned. For the spectators, it is quite a show. For the transport experts, a mammoth job. In Malmberget alone, they have already relocated 45 buildings, but none as complicated as this one. The house mover, Tommy Newland, monitors the transport from behind. He drives behind the second truck. Of course, when the house is bigger, you have to have more focus and more planning and a little bit of more nerves, of course. And he needs them now, for a bunch of lampposts lie ahead. They are not an obstacle in themselves, but they can become one very quickly. We have already turned them 180 degrees. You see the lamppost pointing out, out from the road. So they already prepare it. So. And we're measuring at least twice, so we know we're going to pass them. But we have to do it exactly as we planned. Despite all the planning, what shouldn't happen, happens. We're not going to get it. The lamp post bent and leaning in. The mega transport cannot get past this lamppost. They're going backwards. The worst case scenario has happened. The transport must go in reverse. Despite the fact that braking and backtracking could cause terrible damage to the building. Yeah, you can 
You clear? I'm okay. You can come back down on the right side. They were lucky. Another obstacle overcome. Now there is a stretch of road without any curves. Yeah, I bet the bit is left. But even a straight road is a challenge. Because straight only means no curves. But it doesn't mean that everything is even. So sometimes when the road is leaned to the left, he compensates it, and it looks like it leaned to the right. Because the road is always tilting to one or to the right or to the left, and he makes sure the house is always leveled. So when it's raining like this, he kind of have a crappy job. It is only seven kilometers, but at 10 kilometers per hour. Finally, the beginning of the last difficulty is reached, the first roundabout. The trailer drives left. The house mover assists the road patrol and secures the exit. The only short break for Tommy Newland to catch his breath. Then the journey continues. If it were up to him, the villa could not reach its destination fast enough. <laughs> not yet. This, this is the biggest house, and this is the rainiest day, and it's a weekend tomorrow, so everything with putting this house down is going to be good. The mega transport has reached the last roundabout. Now it enters the final stretch. A house on its way home. It was built nearly 100 years ago. Five weeks ago, Tommy Newland and his team began to prepare it for the transport. One hour ago, the villa was moved from its foundation for the first time. And now, it is arriving at its new home, fully intact. The villa will remain here for the rest of its days. In about three months, the villa from Hoyersbacher will stand on its old granite foundation. It will be filled with new life, and everything will be as if the villa had always been here. But the transport team will never forget this trip. We feel relieved. It's been quite of a long day. Uh, we had some challenges, but we managed quite good. We're all safe. The house is down, and uh, I'm content with it. The villa remains the pride and joy of the village. Only now, the village is Koskoskuye. At the end, the Swedish sky sheds more tears. But no one else joins in. This is a really great moment. The trailer is out, the house is on the cribbings. So uh, the, the, the most of the job is finished now. So we are, this feels really good. This was a really nice trip, except for all this raining. So. This is nice, we are happy. Let's go for celebration, something, maybe for a couple of beers. The biggest and heaviest house in Malmberget has found its new location. As long as it is profitable to dig Swedish steel out of the ground up here in Lapland, houses will be on the move. On stunning mega transports like this.